Hi everyone, I'm Eli, I'm one of the ENT residents in Philadelphia at the PCOM residency. I'm giving an on-call ENT emergencies presentation geared towards our residents in particular. This is a not fully comprehensive list, but kind of goes over the on-call expectations from our residency standpoint, the particular patients that we deal with and our attending preferences. This is not to be thought as as medical advice, but all purely anecdotal information that I've gathered over the last four years of being on call as an ENT resident. So these are some on-call basic points, particular for the ENT residents at PCOM. So if you're an outside resident, feel free to skip forward a couple of slides because this information is more particular towards our residency. We cover from 5 p.m. until 6 a.m. If there is a consult that comes in between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., it's not unreasonable to sign out that consult to the daytime team so you can get to your site on time. You should know what hospitals you're on call for, what seniors and attendings are on call with you, and what patients you're primary for. Fortunately, ENT as a, a service is, is typically a consult service, so we don't have a whole lot of primary patients that we're dealing with at any given time, but particular post-op patients or the occasional trauma patient that we do assume primary, you should be aware of that. Our PGY1s take buddy call with our twos and threes. Our twos and threes are at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, Crozier, Taylor, Riddle, Einstein, and Abington. And then our fours and fives take call at Methodist and Lankanaw and have options to moonlight. You should keep your pager and phone charged on loud and nearby. These are the primary methods that you're going to get contacted with consults. You should keep your ENT call bag stocked. We'll go over what a typical ENT call bag looks like. You should know how to get the flexible fiber optic nasopharyngoscopy scopes at each site. Most of the time they are either within the ENT office or in the ER but sometimes you'll have to go to the ICU or the OR to get them. You should know when to call your senior and when to call your attending. This is an important uh, distinction based on the site that you're at, the attending and the senior resident, but getting comfortable with knowing what consults are appropriate to sign out in the morning versus consults that you should be calling someone in the middle of the night. So our PGY1s take buddy call. The primary purpose is to orient them to all of the hospitals that you will soon cover as a two or a three. So this is getting familiar accessing the clinics, the ER, the OR, finding the NPL in the middle of the night and things like that. And also how to deal with the common on-call ENT emergencies and consults and how to manage them appropriately. This also gives the PGOL ones the opportunity to have exposure to the conversations with the ER doctors, the primary hospitalist or the attendings that are on call. It gives them an opportunity to start writing notes efficiently while on call. And then later in the year, the PGOI one can assist in writing notes and helping actually with the procedures and consults. But the big important message is that no PGY1 should function solo in a hospital to make the life of the two or three easier because this is primarily an educational opportunity for the PGY1. Later in the year, it's not inappropriate to have the PGY1 starting to assume the role a little bit more, but overall this is to orient the, the PGY1 prior to starting call. Briefly with moonlighting that pertains to the fours and fives, we cover two hospitals and the Cherry Hill and Washington Township area. For Jefferson Cherry Hill, Dr. McGrath covers, therefore the resident sees all the floor consults, ED consults, and emergent consults. This happens between 6 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekdays for the Methodist resident, and then on weekdays, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that's the on-call moonlighting resident. We do not cover routine tracheostomy care or change consults at this hospital. And then Jefferson, Washington Township, Hospital in New Jersey, we strictly cover 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., only ED and floor emergencies. And then advanced ENT practice covers everything else. We do not cover Jefferson Stratford Hospital. So I had gotten neurotic at one point to take a picture and categorize every piece of equipment that's in my call bag after hearing someone's call bag got stolen from their car. So I took this picture early in my PGY2 year that basically outlined all of the necessary equipment and instruments that I keep stocked in my call bag. I've used every one of these instruments at least once. It saved me, it saves me time in terms of not rooting around a ENT cart in the emergency room or particularly we're on the floor. But you'll see various items here that we'll talk about throughout this ENT emergencies lecture. And basically I use all of these instruments, um, you know, at some point during the course of my four years while on call. So I think a lot of these are important. There are some things that aren't Picture here, the B-Bird, which is the wireless endoscope, an air tag that just allows me to not forget it in a patient room, and then an atomizer that's used for uh, topical anesthesia prior to a, a scope examination or a procedure. So next, the endoscope eye is a attachment that allows any rigid or flexible scope to be attached to an iPhone. As of now, I don't think there is Android 
um, compatibility, but if you go to this shop, endoscope.i.com, you'll see all of the various adapters that come um, equipped for the I iPhones, and this should be used universally. It's included within our PGY-1 budget. You should be comfortable using this and being proficient in recording not only quality but comprehensive scope examinations, and the advantage to this is many. You can use this to stage laryngeal cancers and relay findings to any staff, co-resident attending. Um, I've used this to retrieve airway or pharyngeal foreign bodies in the wake patient with the assistance of either a nurse or a resident. This allows you to sign out consults to on-call residents after seeing a consult and you scope them. Rather than trying to explain exactly what the airway looked like, you can just simply send them a picture. Um, this allows you to easily staff consults with attendings. It limits the repeat scope examinations on our patients, which I think is good overall. And it's even useful in the preoperative airway assessment for anesthesia. The thing that I would advise is to flip the image for them so they are used to looking at the larynx in their typical view. So in my opinion, there are three goals to being on call. The first one is to get the patient out of the ER, if possible. If this means going into the middle of the night and draining a peritonsillar abscess, saving the patient the admission and getting them back home where they can recover in the comfort of their own environment, I think that's best for everyone. The second one is to relieve the patient's distress, pain, or worry associated with their disease process. You're the expert going in, giving them your expert opinion, even if that means in the middle of the night or any time in the day, I think that's one of the things that we can do for our patients. And the third one is to relieve the daytime resident from dealing with overnight issues. The last thing that you want is to be woken up in the morning from the on-call resident saying, here are all these patients that you need to see in the morning. Okay, that's just not great for teamwork, not great for setting up the on-call uh, the daytime resident from dealing with all of these issues. So a short note on documentation, you should be documenting all on-call events that involve patient care. This is good practice just to keep in mind and to start early. So short progress notes or plan of care notes are appropriate. You should be documenting all patient calls or any prescriptions that you're providing and then updating the appropriate list or handoffs. So the daytime residents kind of know what the on-call night events were. If they happen to see the patient in the clinic the day afterwards or getting a phone call, you can simply look into the chart and realize, okay, they were prescribed medications or they were discussed, you know, post-operative care or something like that. There should be a low threshold to see any primary patient. Like I said, you're the only doctors that are taking care of these patients in the middle of the night. So if there are complaints that you can't quite comprehend or if there is abdominal pain or there's a post-operative problem, you should go in and see that patient to make sure that you're giving the patient the care that they deserve. Um, I had gone through basically all of the on-call problems that we could have uh, or consults and I created a smart phrase in our Google Drive for dot phrases that make you more efficient in writing notes. Feel free to look at those. You should keep passwords and logins up to date at all times and never use anyone's login um, to document or put in orders. Okay, You have to keep all of your passwords and things up to date so you are not faced with this dilemma. So for patient calls, we're notified of these by various different methods depending on the hospital. So that's either Tiger Connect, Epic. Sometimes we get a consult page uh, text message through our phone or it comes through our pager. So the attendings normally get notified on these patient calls as well. That's something to keep in mind. Like I said, some of them come through pager versus text message. You should ask patients if there's um, any concerning post-operative symptoms with their incision site or with a flap for photos. That's one easy trick to allow you to easily figure out the severity of this problem. You should be documenting, again, all patient calls that require prescriptions, and then you should check with the attendings about any post-op patient that deals with rhinoplasty, flaps, or plastic cases. You should also answer and call back all patient calls promptly. This is particularly at Crozier, St. Chris, and Methodist, where we have patients that are sometimes needy. So some other points about resident emergencies, health issues, or if you're sick on call, you should let the senior know immediately when you're having personal issues. Or if you're not able to undergo a call shift, you should let someone know as soon as possible. There should really be no excuse not to answer pages or calls or put orders in if you're too sick to see the patient. You should reach out to co-residents to see if someone can fill in. Um, you should be able to take care of yourself so you can take care of patients is the way I think about it. And basically within our residency, everyone's here to help and no resident should be sick on call. So another small note just about primary patients, like I said, ENT is kind of fortunate that we're not dealing with a lot of primary patients in general. 
the on-call resident should be given a detailed sign-out of all the pertinent clinical information about the primary patient. So this includes medication history, any operative details, complications, strains, things like that. The pain regimen should be given as well, just so the on-call resident knows what type of pain is considered appropriate or inappropriate. The post-op examination details on how a particular wound looked like, if there was a flap, if there were drains, a trach, something like that as well. So really, primary patients should be seen twice daily by the daytime team, once in the morning and once at night. And this kind of resolves the issue of a nurse basically calling right as the on-call resident is coming on about issues that could have been resolved during the day. So operative notes, discharge summary, hospital course, discharge instructions should all be done by the daytime team if the patient's going to be discharged over the weekend. There should be a low threshold to see primary patients, like I said, and a low threshold to consult medicine if they're persistent uh, medical issues or if there's chest pain or things that you know can be easily managed and triaged by the uh, medical team if they're in-house. So our weekend call starts at 5 p.m. on Friday night and ends 6 a.m. Monday morning. So really the success of weekend call relies on, in my opinion, preparation, efficiency, time management, triage, and most importantly, luck. So during sign out, you should be keeping meticulous notes on the patients that you have to see, the places to round, you know, particular discharge instructions, drains to pool, post-op checks, and any pertinent information. In my opinion, you should be starting rounds very early. It's not unusual to hit the road at 5, 6 a.m., especially if you have multiple sites to go to and patients to see. You should be seeing, documenting, and discharging post-op patients by 8 a.m. The attending surgeon should be giving a call or a text message on the overnight events and discharge uh, status before the patient is actually discharged. You should let your senior know if you have multiple sites to round on just to divvy up some of the weekend responsibilities and make the life of both residents easier. In my opinion, the goal is to finish rounding at 6 or at 10 a.m. Therefore, you can just kind of sit around and wait for the consult to come in throughout the day. You can triage routine consults and stack them until it's in either convenient time or location to see them, but important to know that all consults should be seen within 24 hours following the notification of the consult as a general rule. So it's not uncommon to have OR emergencies to cover while you're on call. In particular, our residency sees tonsil bleeds, air digestive foreign bodies, and penetrating neck trauma. These are just the various things that sometimes require operative intervention in the weekend or overnight. So communicating with the senior or junior resident that you're going to the OR is vital. This allows the other resident to have a heads up that they may need to cover all of the other hospitals during the duration of the case. And this includes all fielding of patient calls, refilling prescriptions, seeing other consults in the other hospitals. And the senior resident should really be present with the junior anytime that the case is more involved or at the request of the junior resident. So some of the cases that I would think about would be mastoidectomy, um, you know, complicated sinus uh, cases on a weekend or weeknight airway foreign bodies and sometimes the, the awake trach or difficult trach. And then all juniors and seniors as rules should be competent in the OR. This includes setting up the rule with proper instruments. So in the middle of the night, you should really know how to, you know, set up sinus navigation, airway foreign body, knowing the crucial steps of the surgery, and then being competent in basic skills like suture, not tying, all of that. Overnight, you're considered, in my opinion, the head and neck radiologist. So you are responsible for reading and interpreting x-rays, CTs, MRs, ultrasounds while on call overnight. Generally, these final reads will not be available at the time of the consult. You might get a night hawk, you might only get the ER's interpretation. So really, you should be practicing reading all of these different types of films and knowing the general pathology of the uh, emergencies that we see. My primary resource is YouTube. You can almost find anything you want on YouTube about head and neck radiology. Here are some of the resources to the right. And then the ACR, has an appropriateness criteria that are evidence-based guidelines that allow basically the referring physicians and other providers to know the most appropriate imaging for a specific clinical condition. So not inappropriate to ever give the information on this is the best type of image or sequence that you need for a particular condition. And then there's a lot of really great information from Head Mirror, both ENT in a nutshell, the podcast, which includes on-call emergencies and also the ENT survival guide that also is an on-call reference that a lot of similar information in, in this slide is included more comprehensively in that survival guide. So the way that I broke up the on-call emergencies are as follows. So starting out with infectious emergencies, traumatic emergencies, airway, post-op, bleeding, and then kind of a catch-all miscellaneous emergencies. And you'll see this logo on the top left of the screen indicating what type of emergency we're in. 
So starting out with infectious emergencies, here's the list of the emergencies that we're going to go through. Starting out with the PTA or the peritonsillar abscess, in my opinion, trismus is the biggest symptom that is associated with a peritonsillar abscess. There have been plenty of times that the ER has called, they haven't scanned the patient, the patient looks like they may have a peritonsillar abscess, they say there's not so much trismus, and I ask them to get a scan, and lo and behold, it's asymmetric tonsillitis or chronic tonsillitis. So really the hallmark symptom is trismus, and that's because of the location of the peritonsillar abscess to the muscles of mastication and the pterygoid muscles. So you should be looking at the scan if there is one to determine the need for drainage. Generally, drainage is not considered if it's less than two centimeters or if the patient is tolerating PO and the pain is well controlled. It would be pretty hard to talk a patient into undergoing you know, a needle stick or a, a scalpel incision in the back of the throat if they're tolerating PO and pain is well controlled. Drainage should be considered if it's bigger than two centimeters, if they have significant trismus, if there's recurrence or if there's severe symptoms. The general instruments that are required, a 15 blade, lidocaine with epi, cetacaine, suction, 18 gauge needle, sometimes a hemostat. Don't be afraid to ask the nurse for equipment on the way in. This will expedite the consult. Generally, you don't need to scope these patients. And then there's no such thing really as an intratonsillar abscess. Sometimes the radiologist will read it this way, but if there's pus on the scan, it generally needs to be drained. Um, if you get pus with uh, the IND, or if you get pus with the needle aspiration, therefore you should do a formal IND to ensure that that abscess is, is clearly opened up and you're able to express it all. And then really, if the patient's pain is well controlled and they're tolerating PO, you can send them home. And this generally is with either a seven to 10 day course of clindamycin, augmentin, amedrol, pack, and then ENT follow-up to consider tonsillectomy. Everyone gets all up in arms about the location of the carotid artery in relation to a peritonsillar abscess. So this is a, a retropharyngeal carotid artery. And then when you see the peritonsillar abscess, say for example, this is three centimeters, you not only have the three centimeters, but the general two and a half or two centimeters away from the carotid. So you don't really have to worry about that as much as some people may be concerned about. And here are the classic um, other symptoms. So uvular deviation, palatal effacement, hot potato voice, and then odynophagia. So next, the RPA, or the retropharyngeal abscess, the hallmark, in my opinion, is rotational head movement. This is because of the prevertebral muscles are inflamed or in proximity to this area. So it's pretty painful to rotate. A NPL is essential because you need to assess the various degrees of airway involvement. You generally can't train these at bedside, and then you should really be examining the, the CT for the etiology. So in children, it's commonly because of separative lymphadenitis. Um, in older adults, this can be because of ortho hardware, hardware uh, foreign body, or trauma. And then you should be considering whether or not these patients need to be added on for the next day to the OR for an IND and washout. And then you can see on lateral film x-ray, there are normal thicknesses in children and adults based on the cervical level, something to keep in mind. And then always important to remember our various fascias associated with the different spaces and what do these spaces you know descend towards the mediastinum the diaphragm things like that so this is a single slice sagittal of a typical retropharyngeal abscess you can see slight rim enhancement and then nasopharyngoscopy would reveal the following so this is a torn wall cyst not really associated with this at all that's just an incidental finding and then you can see the retropharyngeal abscess, the bulge in the posterior pharyngeal wall, slightly effacing over the airway and probably giving the patient a muffled voice and symptoms. I believe this patient was able to be fiber optically intubated without concern and simply evacuating this area and IV antibiotics and steroids with an admission was all the patient needed in order to resolve. So next we'll discuss a peripharyngeal space abscess. So remember that the peripharyngeal space is an inverted pyramid with the base of the pyramid at the skull base and the apex descending down towards the hyoid bone. And there are pre and post styloid compartments. This is considered the central space of the neck because it abuts the following spaces, the peritonsillar, the masticator, the parotid, and retropharyngeal spaces. 
The symptoms are generally nonspecific. They can include throat pain, trismus, malaise, and fever. And NPL is essential. You need to figure out if there's airway involvement. And then they may require either bedside, but more likely OR for IND. And then you can see the various spaces that are associated with it in remembering your anatomy and accessing the peripharyngeal space through a transcervical incision. Then we have, again, a endoscope eye video, and then also a CAT scan here indicating a large multiloculated peripharyngeal space abscess that's extending into the chest and mediastinum and retropharyngeal, and then the scope examination on our left showing a large re retropharyngeal bulge on the right side. These are two uh, different patients. This isn't necessarily a peripharyngeal space abscess, but this is a peripharyngeal space foreign body. This was a patient who was intubated on the field by EMS. There was a traumatic intubation and there were some radiodense areas within the apex of the peripharyngeal space and also the base of the peripharyngeal space. And ultimately this ended up being a tooth that was dislodged during intubation and a laceration within the peripharyngeal space uh, forced this tooth up near the skull base. And this was successfully retrieved in the operating room after exploring the laceration. Next, we will be going through the orbital complications of sinusitis. Generally, this is a pediatric problem. You should be able to differentiate the following conditions based on the channeler classification of orbital complications of sinusitis. So this was historically a classification scheme prior to the advent of imaging. Therefore, you had to be able to differentiate these conditions based on physical examination. Still really important to know, but imaging will basically give you the information that you need to differentiate these. Starting with Chandler 1, which is preorbital or preceptal cellulitis, this is the area that is just anterior to the orbital septum. Second is orbital cellulitis, this is postseptal cellulitis. Type 3 is when you actually form a subperiosteal abscess between the lamina and the periosteum. Type 4, or channel class 4, is an actual frank orbital abscess. And then 5, which is the worst, is the cavernous sinus thrombosis. So again, the orbital septum lies right near the anterior crest of the lacrimal sac. So any, anything anterior to this area is considered preceptal, and then anything posterior is postseptal. And then here is the classification scheme for uh, the Chandler classification based on physical exam findings. So one, like we said, preceptal cellulitis limited to the eyelid. Two, orbital cellulitis, it's now postseptal into the eyelid and orbit, and there can be decreased vision, restricted eye movements, there can be a relative afferent pupillary defect. Type three or Chandler classification three is a, is a subperiosteal abscess. Type four is an orbital abscess. And type 5 is the cavernous sinus thrombosis. So feel free to pause and take a look at the different physical exam findings that are associated with each one. But like I said, really, your imaging is going to be your next step, even when you have concern of any 2 through 4. Type 1, you, you necessarily don't need an image. Then it's more of a catch-all, deep neck space abscesses is the topic that we're going to be discussing next. This includes the peripharyngeal space that we talked about, carotid sheath space abscesses, retropharyngeal space, prevertebral and dangerous spaces, submandibular and sublingual spaces, masticator, pretracheal, and parotid spaces. So commonly these abscesses do originate by some infection in the upper air digestive tract. Generally this is either odonogenic and can be from the oropharyngeal cavity, sinonasal, a foreign body, a malignancy with secondary superinfection, suppurative lymphadenitis, infections of congen congenital tracts or fistulas like branchial cleft cysts or thyroid glossal duct cysts, iatrogenic after surgery of the head and neck, trachea or esophagus. So the flora generally is polymicrobial, particularly in the odontogenic uh, causes. Symptoms primarily depend on the involved spaces that may include dysphagia or dynophagia for peripharyngeal and retropharyngeal spaces, nuchal rigidity in prevertebral spaces, trismus with masticator, space with pterygoid involvement, and then as a catch-all, otalgia, dysphonia, and neck pain can be associated. The first concern when evaluating a patient with these deep neck spaces um, infections are securing an airway and then prevention of disease progression. This is really the, the role for the ENT surgeon is to provide an airway and prevent disease progression. So you don't want to 
you know, sit on a peritonsillar abscess that then turns into you know, a uh, septic thromboflebitis, such as Lemire syndrome, or getting a mediastinitis after inferior descent from a retropharyngeal space abscess, or you know, uh, evolution from a Chandler 3 into a cavernous sinus thrombosis, or a floor of mouth abscess into a Ludwig's angina, for example. So it's crucial to distinguish these conditions from necrotizing fasciitis, again, which is something that we'll discuss later in the lecture. Ludwig's angina represents a rapidly progressing cellulitis of the following bilateral spaces, submental, sublingual, and submandibular. This is the classic appearance of Ludwig's angina. You can see the patient here on the top right. The floor of mouth is woody. In palpation, it's elevated, it's edematous. The cases of Ludwig angina are almost always caused by odontogenic sources. Like I said, the floor of mouth is firm and elevated, and posterior display of the tongue is what leads to airway obstruction. So you can see the collection in these bilateral spaces in the neck that lead to retro displacement and eventual airway compromise in these patients. So therefore, airway management is paramount. This may include flexible fiber optic oral intubation or even nasal intubation or an awake tracheostomy. IND generally yields dishwater type of fluid and not generally a clear purulence. The Milo Highway line is an important anatomical landmark that can kind of explain the progression of a Ludwig's angina type of picture. Remembering that these teeth, 31 and 32, on the right side at least, and same with the molars on the left, their tooth uh, root apices actually plunge beneath the myelohyoid line. Therefore, this odontic in uh, odontogenic infection can disseminate from just the teeth down into the submental, sublingual, and submandibular spaces. And then when we get a consult and the ER thinks it's uh, Ludwig's, it's almost never Ludwig's. It's generally a submandibular abscess or something like that. But really, I like to um, reiterate to them that Ludwig's represents bilateral spaces, all six of them. Submandibular on both sides, sublingual on both sides, and submental on both sides. This can also be the typical presentation of Ludwig's is a bilateral submental swelling that's, like I said, generally associated with an odontogenic infection. This lady recently had a tooth that was pulled and inadvertently a tooth root was left behind within the mandible that caused this infection. And you can see sagittally, although there is not retro displacement of the tongue quite yet, there is a con collection within the six spaces described before. The next entity in the list of infectious ENT emergencies that we're going to talk about is mastoiditis. So mastoiditis is generally regarded as a clinical diagnosis. You can see up here this poor child on the top right. His left ear has postauricular swelling, there's erythema, there's likely an abscess forming under there, and there's certain proptosis of the ear. There is either plus or minus otorrhea and middle ear purulence encountered. This may be the uh, clinical picture that you can see is a clear otitis media with a uh, suppurative type of fluid, vascular congestion as well. The radiographic features are really the hallmark of the disease. So coalescence of these mastoid air cells, typically you'll see a small honeycomb type appearance of the mastoid air cells with varied uh, degree of pneumatization, but you can see coalescence or kind of formation into one common cavity, which is indicative of bony erosion. You can see even erosion of the sigmoid plate into this uh, patient, which precludes some sort of intracranial abscess or sigmoid sinus thrombosis. This is important to add on to the operating room for at least a myrgotomy and tube or a, a formal cortical mastoidectomy. And it's important to differentiate acute mastoiditis from chronic otomastoiditis and mastoid effusion. So mastoid effusion will appear very similar to this, but there is no bony breakdown. There's no bony erosion or coalescence. The radio, uh, the Radiologists will typically comment on acute mastoiditis as being a mastoid effusion. To ENTs, these are two separate entities. So anytime you have middle ear effusion, the middle ear is in continuity with the mastoid air cells and the mastoid antrum. So you will have fluid by definition in the mastoid. There is a clinical conundrum that can occur when you do have a middle ear that is clear, but you have a hot mastoid. And how can this happen? It's when you have an attic block. So when the attic um, that connects the mastoid to the middle ear is blocked with granulation. You can still have buildup of infection and pressure and cause an acute mastoiditis with a clear ear. So that's an important thing to note. Next, we'll be talking about epiglottitis. So fortunately, the incidence of epiglottitis in children has decreased dramatically since the Hib vaccine. If there's any suspicion of a true place of epiglottitis, 
you should immediately go to the operating room in a calm environment with the with the child and avoid any airway manipulation until the senior ENT or anesthetist is present. This can be a very tenuous airway and you really only have one good attempt to secure the airway in cases like this before you have to resort to surgical airways. The common bacteria that are associated with epiglottitis are Haemophilus influenza, strep pyogenes and pneumonia, Staph aureus, and then rarely Candida species. The clinical triad that you can see somewhat in this netter uh, drawing is this child who is tripoding, um, and then there's associated drooling, dysphagia, and distress. Nowadays, it's more commonly seen in adults, at least within our institutions, and because of the caliber of the airways uh, large, it's normally not as life-threatening. Sometimes you'll get consulted from the emergency room or a call from an urgent care um, from a frantic provider that is looking in the back of either a young child or even a, a young adult's throat and they see the epiglottis and they determine that this is abnormal because the epiglottis is not normally visualized. This does not represent epiglottitis. Remember, the position of the hyoid and the larynx is elevated within children and this can even persist. So this is a normal anatomic variant that is not associated with increased risk of epiglottitis. So this is the typical lateral neck x-ray that's associated with epiglottitis. It's the thumbprint sign, so imagine that a radio, radiologist has uh, inadvertently put his thumb over the epiglottis, and that's the, the classic thumbprint sign. You can see two um, NPL examinations that could be mimickers or even show this similar finding. So the first patient was a young male who presented to the ENT clinic with a lump in his throat, and on lateral neck x-ray, you would definitely see a similar picture as the thumbprint sign, but this is a benign epiglottic cyst or a retention cyst. And then down here is after foreign body ingestion, a patient was eating crabs and felt a crab shell um, scratch his throat. It was actually lodged into his epiglottis for a couple of days. And this is just kind of a unilateral epiglottic swelling, not the rapidly progressive epiglottitis that we would see in children. But again, conserve managed, uh, or conservatively managed with IV antibiotics and steroids in time, and he resolved. And then this is really the true epiglottitis. This was in a 50-year-old male who had a viral illness and progressive sore throat and dysphagia, strider, and dysphonia. You can see on flexible fiber optic examination, the epiglottis, the lateral walls are actually touching there. The arytenoids are very edematous and bulky. There's almost no airway visualized within this examination. Then you can see on axial CT, the thickened epiglottis, the very bulky arytenoids. This patient was immediately taken to the operating room with plan for awake trach versus nasotracheal intubation. And he fortunately had successful fiber optic, flexible um, nasotracheal intubation, followed by IV antibiotic steroids in time and was extubated without concern. The next infectious emergency to be familiar with is malignant otitis externa. This is somewhat of an antiquated term now. It's more commonly referred as skull-based osteomyelitis. The hallmark here is on this V-bird picture on the top right, abundant granulation at that bony cartilaginous junction. This can be confused as an oral polyp or even a cancer, but the suspicion should be pretty high when you have some sort of immunosuppressed patient. So this could be diabetes, cancer, organ transplant, the suspicion also gets higher when there is concomitant either facial nerve paralysis, paresis, or even lower cranial nerve involvement. Historically, these were both diagnosed and followed with a technetium-99 scan and then clinically with gallium-67 citrate, but nowadays PET MRI with these different sequences or high-res CT are more commonly employed for diagnosis and follow-up. And not unlike other forms of invasive uh, lesions within the ear canal, you see bony erosion. There should be a low threshold for admission, although technically this entity can be treated with PO antibiotics and um, topical antibiotics as outpatient. The next ENT infectious emergency that we're gonna talk about is acute invasive fungal sinusitis, remembering that this differs drastically from the other forms of fungal sinusitis. The on-call goal, in my opinion, is for the ENT to establish the diagnosis, and this will eventually expedite the care and the treatment for this condition, which is very, very, grim if this diagnosis is made. Our NPL examination will show the black turbinate sign, which can also be seen on MR. So remember that the nasal mucosa generally enhances with IV contrast and the absence of the enhancement 
um, on IV contrast suggest some degree of um, devascularization or necrosis. So that's the black turbinate sign, which can be seen here. Necrotic nasal mucosa can be observed as in these pictures, and then this area is relatively insensate. This allows bedside biopsy to be performed with relative ease because this insensate tissue, generally a rigid endoscope, zero degree is, is normally employed, a Blakesley forceps and a specimen cup. The next step is to take this specimen directly to pathology and try to aid in the diagnosis of this condition. Really the risk uh, groups for acute invasive fungal sinusitis are some degree of immunosuppression. So this could be a blood malignancy, a solid uh, organ transplant, um, diabetes, HIV, immunodeficiency. The species that are generally encountered are either mucoralis or aspergillus. The mucoralis, such as mucor, rhizopus, or obsidia, are the non-septated hyphae that branch at 90 degrees, and then aspergillus are the septated hyphae that branch in 45 degree. Next in ENT, Infectious emergencies, we'll be discussing frontal sinus osteomyelitis, also known as Potts puffy tumor. So this represents the spread of frontal sinus disease through the brains of breast, which you can see down here, the diploic veins that communicate directly from the frontal sinus to the dura. So some of the um, concerning signs and symptoms that are suggestive of intracranial extension include uh, persistent headache, nuchal rigidity, nausea and vomiting, generalized uh, malaise and altered mental status, various cranial nerve neuropathies, and even focal neurologic deficits. In this region or these concerning symptoms, a neurosurgical consult is definitely required. It's important to try to get a nasal culture if feasible to um, give culture directed antibiotics and generally some form of CT or MRI is generally warranted. This is um, the typical presentation of POTS puffy tumor, um, which can be kind of a, a pillowy, uh, soft, doughy mass of the frontal sinus or the frontal um, tissues. And finally, in the ENT infectious emergencies, we'll discuss necrotizing fasciitis. So identification of this entity is paramount when the suspicion is high. Again, this is a very high mortality type of condition. This is a life-threatening rapidly progressive infection that results in progressive destruction of soft tissue um, and thrombosis of associated vasculature that requires emergent debridement. So the findings that are concerning for necrotizing fasciitis are severe pain, crepitus, bola, erythema, edema. Sometimes sepsis may include tachycardia, fever, and hypotension. And then imaging, as you can see above, generally shows some degree of filled air spaces in the head and neck. But also, this is not always pathognomonic for necrotizing fasciitis. So you can see the airspace filled within the right submandibular region in this patient who actually did have necrotizing fasciitis. And then here is the picture um, following a debridement of necrotic tissue. Moving on towards the next section of the ENT emergencies are the traumatic emergencies. There are a lot here that we're going to go over. This is particularly a high volume kind of ENT emergency that we see particularly in our inner city hospitals. Facial trauma, in particular mandibular trauma and fractures, are a common consult that we'll see. I will plug the AO surgical reference here as a great resource that goes not only over mandibular trauma but all mid-facial uh, trauma and fractures and gives a step-by-step -step approach in towards uh, diagnosis and treatment, gives all of the different surgical techniques just a great resource overall. It's available as an app, I believe, and a website. So look that up if you're dealing with any mandibular trauma to any degree, I highly recommend it. So going forward towards mandibular fractures, important to review the CAT scan again yourself. You are essentially the radiologist. You should be uh, noting additional fractures of the mid-face, mandible, and temporal bone. And ultimately this lecture and this slide is not going to go over the various uh, degrees of which you would treat and fix these mandibular fractures, but overall you need to decide if this requires operative intervention. For example, if it's a young patient who is dental, uh, you know, has a good dentition, has an isolated symphyseal fracture, and is otherwise in good health and reliable, they can foreseeably go home with a soft diet without need for open reduction internal fixation or MMF. But this is something that you will come to learn which mandible fractures need operative intervention um, after your Einstein rotation. So an open fracture generally requires IV antibiotics. You can see the right side here um, picture of uh, the patient's left hemimandible. There's a fracture, clear open component. 
Also, not inappropriate to ask the radiologist to obtain 3D reconstructions. This aids in our surgical planning and intraoperative uh, plans as well. So determining again who will admit the patient, particularly some trauma patients are covered by trauma, but otherwise if it's an isolated mandibular fracture, which happens at, um, you know, at sometimes, ENT will have to be the primary service that is admitting this patient. If ENT admits the patient, you must see the patient. And then an important fact is to document V3 numbness if it's present. So there could be a mandibular uh, angle or body fracture that would transact or stretch the inferior alveolar nerve. Therefore, they're going to have V3 distribution numbness. This is something that you're going to want to document and note prior to any operative intervention, because if you don't, everyone is going to assume that you cause this V3 numbness, which is just unacceptable. So you should document any nerve related injury, particularly in mandible fractures. And then generally, these patients don't require an NPL. Lefort fractures are the next mid-face trauma that we're going to be going over. Again, important to review the CT yourself, noting additional fractures in the mid-face, mandible, and temporal bone. Sometimes these will require an NPL. There are patients who have bilateral Lefort threes that do have airway compromise because essentially the whole lower cranium is compressing on the posterior or pharynx. CT by definition, must involve bilateral fracture of pterygoid plates. You can see the yellow arrows here, indicating fractures of basically all four, you know, lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid. Generally, there's a high degree of impact that requires before it fractures to occur. So most often they do have concomitant brain injury that may delay operative intervention. Generally, there is some degree of epistaxis, which can be conservatively managed, either with nasal packing or just time. And then another um, fact that you want to remember is to ensure that there's no CSF rhinomeria. Sometimes this can occur with these higher ethmoid type of fractures associated with Lefort fracture two and threes. Next, zygomatic arch fractures. So this is a, another common mid-face trauma that you'll see, not always something that need, we need to intervene on. So commonly you can palpate the zygomatic arch to see if there's pain or if there is an obvious fracture line. A base view on physical exam may show some malar depression. You could just get the uh, facial CT and also see, you know, a uh, abnormal contour of the zygomatic arch. This one in particular has two uh, broken segments compared to the normal left side. So the reasons that we would intervene as ENTs primarily are, th are for either trismus or cosmetic concerns. I put pain on there. That's not something that you should generally operate on a patient for is for pain in these areas, but sometimes it can help. Um, with the trismus that's associated with pain. Also, if there is cosmetic concern and this is far out or it's a patient who is not a great surgical candidate, you can do malar implants or fillers. You should see um, if there are additional fractures of the surrounding area, so the zygomatico maxillary complex fracture, which we'll talk about later, or concomitant orbital floor or orbital wall fractures. There can be um, different operative techniques for reduction, the Gillies temporal incision, as you can see up here, remembering that, it, that the dissection plane should exclude the branches of the uh, facial nerve within the dissection. Or if you're doing a keen incision, that's a, an intraoral um, method of reduction. And then zygomatic arch fractures result in this uh, mechanical interference of the mandibular coronoid process, and that prevents the mouth from opening fully. So you can imagine here this right depressed zygomatic arch is impinging on the temporalis muscle between the coronoid, which would be a slice below, and that can cause the trismus. Next that I alluded to in the previous slide is the zygomatic or maxillary complex or ZMC fractures. So this historically was described as a tripod fracture. In reality, it's a tetrapod fracture that involves the following. So zy zygomatico temporal, maxillary, frontal, and sphenoid areas. So important for ZMC fractures is to assess for uh, concomitant orbital injury as there is a pretty high risk of having associated orbital component of the fracture. So you can see upwards of 50 actually have some degree of orbital floor, orbital rim, lateral orbital wall component. So really the physical exam findings are going to be an inferiorly uh, placed zygoma, somewhat of a droopy eye laterally as you can see in this picture. The CAT scan will show uh, various degrees of uh, malar depression, and then you should involve ophthalmology if needed. If there's any degree of you know changes within the visual acuity, ocular pressures, things like that, don't be afraid to get ophthalmology, uh, ophthalmology involved to assess.
Next in our traumatic emergencies is temporal bone fractures. This is a common consult that we see at all of our hospitals. The diagnosis is often by a uh, CT. It's ideal to have a CT temporal bone or an IAC protocol in which there are thin slices. The traditional method of categorizing this used to be transverse or longitudinal fractures, and this was in relation to the Petrus pyramid, but now more often the convention is otic capsule sparing versus otic capsule violating types of fractures. So knowing the difference between those, what fracture types are, are you more likely to have facial nerve or hearing involvement is important. Here's a B-board picture of a typical hemotympanum that can be associated with it. Um, sometimes you also see various degrees of canal laceration. So what you wanna check is facial nerve function, Hearing with a tuning fork determines sensorineural neural hearing, sensorineural neural hearing loss versus conductive hearing loss. Remembering a conductive hearing loss is generally due to some degree of hemotympanum versus acicular uh, injury or um, you know displacement. You can have sensorineural neural hearing loss if you actually have involvement of the otic capsule itself. CSF otorrhea can be tested either with beta two transferrin or beta trace protein, and then um, the degree of vertigo and nystagmus. Um, can happen as well as a post-concussive type of syndrome, but persistent vertigo is uncommon, but can be associated with post-traumatic BPPD, otic capsule fractures, or a perilymphatic fistula. So if you do see a canal laceration, not a bad idea to maybe put in an otowick and have some ofloxacin drops just to prevent uh, EAC canal stenosis. And then an audiogram is generally advised in our institutions four to six weeks as an outpatient as we don't typically have inpatient audiology. Next, we'll move on to frontal sinus fractures, which can be broadly subcategorized into anterior table and posterior table fractures. Briefly, anterior table fractures are mainly the concern is cosmesis and frontal sinus outflow function, which is rare. Remember that the frontal sinus does not have an osteum like other sinuses, but does have a narrowing that is called the frontal infundibulum. Remembering that this infundibulum passes through the following structures. Anteriorly is the agronazi in the frontal beak. Posteriorly is the frontal recess. Laterally is the uncinate process or uh, lamina propria, And then medially is our middle turbinate. The posterior table fractures, our biggest concern is really CSF leak. Fortunately, 50% of the traumatic CSF leaks will spontaneously resolve within one week with conservative management. They're less likely to spontaneously resolve if you see posterior displacement greater than five millimeters. The conservative management that we generally prescribe is bed rest, head of bed, head of bed elevation, stool softeners, and avoiding valsalva maneuvers such as nose blowing. CSF diversion is something that neurosurgical colleagues will generally advise as either a lumbar drain or an EVD can be added if conservative management is not effective. Antibiotics are kind of controversial. Prophylactic antibiotics have actually not been proven to show any risk of meningitis. And then short and long-term follow-up is important because complications such as mucosils um, and frontal sinus um, or frontal sinusitis or outflow tract problems can develop. And then there's no strong consensus on the timing of follow-up. So you can see in this 3D recon, there's a depressed fracture here. This is a combined anterior and posterior table. And then this is a isolated anterior table fracture. Next in our traumatic emergencies, we'll talk about nasoorbital ethmoid or NOE fractures. So Markowitz has described different types that you can see above. Basically, if there's a large fragment without any uh, canthal involvement, if there is a comminuted fracture without canthal involvement, and then a um, comminuted fracture with canthal involvement. You can see this guy here with an obvious telecanthus, a distance between the eyes is different. Uh, or is different, that, that's a telltale sign of an NOE fracture or a medial canthal ligament uh, injury. So you should inspect for rounding of the medial orbital commissure, which like I said, suggests the medial canthal detachment. You can do the bowstring test, which um, basically is a maneuver that you try to snap the, um, the eyelid back into place. The average in intracanthal distance is between 35 and 40. Again, this is probably one that you wanna get your ophthalmologist involved with and then not forgetting to assess for CSF leak, orbital injury, or concomitant septal hematomas, which we'll talk about later. Laryngeal trauma can be subcategorized into the Schaefer classification for laryngeal injuries, starting with group one, which is uh, simply a minor laceration hematoma without any fracture, as you can see above in this laryngoscopy picture. So group one, generally medical management with steroids, antibiotics, PPI humidification, and voice rest, which is recommended for all patients as you'll see here. Group two is when you start to have fractures, larger hematomas, or lacerations 
you can consider a DL in the OR and esophagoscopy. These patients may, come, may occasionally require tracheostomy. If not, serial airway assessments are recommended. Group 3, tracheostomy is generally required because you have displaced fractures, focal fold immobility, large lacerations, or massive edema. Group 4, tracheostomy again is required. This is when you start to have anterior laryngeal disruption, multiple fractures, or severe mucosal injuries. Generally, these patients will require some form of plating or wiring, keels or stents, and repair of endolaryngeal injuries. And then the worst is the group five, which is complete laryngo laryngotracheal separation, or when the cricoid actually comes off of the uh, trachea. So these patients are generally in severe respiratory distress. Intubation may be impossible because um, of the laryngotracheal separation. You can technically do it, but it can be challenging. An upfront tracheostomy may be required. And then early surgical repair is required in most of these places. Particularly in the older population, when the um, thyroid cartilages are ossified, it's not uncommon with laryngeal trauma to have fractures, but maybe in a child, you may have a green stick fracture when the um, cartilage is still relatively pliable. The next one of the most commonly broken bones in the body is the nasal bone fracture. Therefore, it's going to be a very common phone call that a consultant is going to ask a uh, need for follow-up. One of the important things that you need to do is exclude other facial fractures, and that's generally with a CT max face. Um, exclude a septal hematoma, which we'll talk about next, any open component to the nasal bone fracture, and then in severe trauma cases, CSF leak. It is a clinical diagnosis. No imaging is required, but you'll see not uncommonly either plain film or CT you know, showing nasal bone fractures. We don't typically fix these. The only real two reasons that I ask the patients um, is, is there a cosmetic concern? Does the nose look funny to you or is the nose not in its normal position? Or if there's functional issues, if you can't breathe through the nose, those would be two reasons that you would um, consider operative intervention. Occasionally they do have some degree of nosebleed. It's self-limiting. A mirror cell pack will generally work well. If a patient presents immediately following the injury, you can do bedside um, close reduction. Generally, patients don't want that done. However, if the swelling is large or if it's delayed, then you need to basically uh, set the patient up for a five-day follow-up in the clinic to assess whether or not they still meet the cosmetic or functional concerns for a close reduction. And generally, close reduction within this time frame is uh, generally the fix um, because the nasal bones haven't fused or um, you know ossified back into place. But if they have, then you'll need actual osteotomies, either percutaneous or endonasal, with an open reduction if it's severely comminuted. In all facial trauma, you want to exclude septal hematoma. This can be a very morbid type of condition if it's not treated or identified. So the suspicion should be pretty high if there's nasal, nasal obstruction with severe pain after nasal trauma. This can either be seen on CT with a septal fracture. Um, you should not confuse this or let ER residents or primary care Physicians confuse this with inferior turbinate hypertrophy. It may be unilateral or bilateral. So the way that this happens is just like an auricular hematoma that we'll talk about is when you have disruption of the perichondrium and the perichondrium elevates and separates off of the cartilage, remembering that the perichondrium provides the blood supply to the cartilage. So when you have this dead space open up, the cartilage no longer has its vascular supply, and then it ends up necrosing and can even secondarily become infected with a septal abscess, which can obviously lead to nasal deformity, in, partic in particular a septal abscess um, with septal hematoma. So like we said, untreated can develop septal abscesses or an ascending intracranial infection um, or just septal uh, necrosis with a saddle nose deformity. So after injecting the 1% lidocaine to the septum, you want to make an incision through the mucosa and perichondrium. You want to express the hematoma. You want to flush the cavity thoroughly. And then you want to place a doyle splint or some degree of septal um, mattress stitch quilt suture that allows the perichondrium to reapproximate. You should be giving anti-staphylococcal antibiotics while these uh, splints are in place. Um, and then follow up within two to three days for bolster removal and to ensure no recurrence of the hematoma. Not uncommonly, you might get a call from the ER um, revealing this entity, which is this area just in the caudal septum uh, more superiorly. This is not a septal hematoma. This is a normal um, anatomic structure called the nasal swell body. With the same pathophysiology as the septal hematoma, we'll talk about auricular hematomas again. This happens when there is generally a shearing type of force on the pinna. 
in which the perichondrium separates from the underlying cartilage and a hematoma forms. Again, this can be bilateral. It's generally clinically apparent you have loss of contour in the normal anatomy of the ear, again, due to shearing forces. This may involve only anterior, posterior, or both sides. And then again, a bolster dressing can be fashioned um, to decrease the dead space of this area after the hematoma has been evacuated. Zero form, like you can see in this picture here, dental rolls can commonly be used as well. A tip is to use nylon, unbraided stitch is best because it slides between the tissues. You can straighten out the, the needle that comes with it, or if you can get a Keith needle or a straight needle for the mattress suture. Antibiotic coverage should be used for the duration of the bolster, and you should follow up in five to seven days. So generally, I um, will make an incision along the normal curvature of the, um, of the helix. You don't need to block the entire ear to do this. You can simply inject on your proposed incision, although there are ways that we'll talk about to block the entire ear. As a note, you can see battle sign here, which is the postauricular or mastoid type of ecchymosis. In this, you want to rule out middle cranial fossa, fractures, or injuries. Up here, you can see a recurrent type of auricular hematoma. You can see posteriorly a zeroform uh, ulcer was fashioned into place, but the blood is actually estratizated anteriorly and now is kind of filling up the conchal bowl. This is a tough problem to deal with. Um, in this situation, what I would do is make an incision in the dependent portion and maybe put in a penrose. Next, related to ear trauma, is the auricular avulsion that we see not uncommonly either with motor vehicle accidents, uh, blunt trauma, and sometimes with um, animal bites or human bites. So the blood supply to the ear is robust. But the cartilage, like we said, derives its blood supply mainly from the perichondrium, but also the overlying skin. So everything must be covered. The goal here is to cover all of the exposed cartilage. So really, knowing how to block the ear effectively prior to any manipulation or procedure is vital. So like I said before, I normally just inject over the proposed incision when I'm doing an auricular hematoma, but for a complex laceration like this, you want to effectively block the entire ear. So you can see this X-taped uh, pattern of injection that involves four different areas of injection, kind of all four quadrants of the ear. So you want to avoid cutting needles. This may easily tear the cartilage. You can consider using an otowick um, with drops if there's uh, you know, canal involvement to prevent canal stenosis. You want to um, obviously rule out any auricular hematoma, which can be you know, concomitant with these types of injuries, and you use a bolster just like before. If there's exposed cartilage, dirty wound, or just you know, as a safety measure, using a fluoroquinolone is important. So you can see some of the degrees of um, auricular avulsion that you have here. There is another technique that isn't commonly employed, at least within our institution, but you can make an incision in the post-auricular crease and basically tunnel and bury the exposed cartilage to implant in a later date as a option for a you know complete ear um, pinna loss. But generally, it's worthwhile to try to reapproximate this area. Like we said, the blood supply is pretty robust, so things, although they may look pretty bad right afterwards, give them the chance, and more often than not, they will actually um, you know, uh, take. So unless you have a microvascular surgeon at your disposal, you know, this is probably the best option for this, but microsurgical techniques have been advocated for auricular avulsion in certain institutions, but not particularly in ours. So moving on to just complex lacerations. So this is a common on-call emergency that you're going to have to deal with. These do take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of planning, and kind of a um, algorithmic type of approach into successively managing these. So I have some charts here um, for your disposal of just the different suture um, types that we can use, the absorption proper properties, reactivity, the suture materials of choice based on the site, um, you know, what we use in the head and neck uh, region if it's mucosal or things like that, and then also the medications that we use commonly for anesthesia, knowing that the maximal doses should be accounted for. So really the questions in my mind that I answer prior to um, prior to closing these lacerations are, does it need closure in the first place? Commonly areas that are uh, concave might not require any type of closure as they heal pretty well with granulation tissue. Is this something that you can adequately close within the ER or is this something that you're gonna have to take to the OR, particularly you know, more important children? Dissolvable or permanent sutures, is the patient reliable? Is it someone that is going to reliably come back to the clinic for removal? Is it a, an area that is feasible to remove without too much discomfort? Do you need antibiotics? Is there missing tissue? 
Sometimes it may look like, particularly with dog bites that you'll see in the next couple of slides, that there might be missing tissue. Is that you know a concern? But more often than not, you can try to piece back the areas kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Do you need to debride tissue? Generally, this is not recommended, even if um, it is rather relatively devitalized. Um, you should always watch and wait and maybe debride you know, over the next couple of days. Do you need to remove foreign debris? This is important because any um, any foreign bodies that are going to be you know, stuck in the patient's wound are going to compromise the aesthetic outcome and the closure. So if this is glass from an accident or if this is plant material or even if this is dried blood, you want to really remove all of these foreign materials to really give you the best aesthetic outcome. Are there nerves, arteries, veins within this area that we need to um, assess or we need to re anastomose or things like that? We'll, we'll go over different considerations there. Local versus topical anesthetic, particularly for the vermilion border. You don't want to distort that area because it's something that is very noticeable if you get that off by even a quarter of a millimeter. So maybe using some emla cream or some topical anesthetic versus distorting it with local. Um, can I block the face? We'll talk about the different blocks. And then the biggest point is irrigation. So irrigate the heck out of any wound, which is going to obviously provide the most antiseptic um, environment. It's going to allow you to see the, the tissue planes and the borders best. And it is going to basically create a environment that is going to give you the best chance for the best aesthetic outcome. So this is a plug for a fantastic article that was written in the late 90s in the Plastics Journal. It's titled How to Block and Tackle the Face. So these uh, blocks are used to not only conserve the amount of lidocaine that you're using for a patient that might have you know, polytrauma and general surgery or trauma surgeries using different forms of local anesthesia, but also it allows the patient to have kind of the best uh, anesthetic block of the face if you target this you know, this peripheral nerve. So um, this is a fantastic journal or uh, journal article that goes over all of the different blocks and how to do them. So I advise you to, to read into this and to remember your anatomy and how to access these nerves to block. So these are real lacerations that we've encountered in our residency. Most of them are either from, you know, domestic abuse, um, dog bites in particular, um, car accidents, you know, and other MVCs, things like that. So um, figuring out you know, how do I best address um, the, the particular location? You know, do I need to remove hair? Do I need to um, do I need to be worried about any vital structures that may be nearby? In this particular dog bite, is there devitalized tissue or is there missing tissue? Um, what kind of suture should I use? Maybe in this intranasal component to the uh, laceration that's here. The vermilion border is important again to line up. Um, and then, you know, is there um, is there more involvement that might need to be taken to the OR for something like this, this large, you know, dog bite to the nose? To the uh, photos from before, as you can see, you kind of piece these pictures back with like a jigsaw pattern type of technique, trying to still recreate that vermilion border, putting back the tissue as best you can, really opting for dissolvable sutures in the mucosal areas, but the, um, the um, cutaneous portion of the lip, you can use sutures that come out. Um, like a proline here um, and you know encouraging the patient to come back and use good wound care techniques and then anytime you're concerned of a large wound not a bad idea to put a penrose or a drain to allow the uh, hematoma to drain out. Another very common consultation that we'll get are orbital wall fractures. Generally again these do not require a whole lot of immediate operative intervention. You can see the surgical intervention or the indications um, up top here, really the big ones are the ocular cardiac reflex, something that would rush you in, which is not all that common of an entity. If you have two millimeters of enophthalmos, um, ocular motility disruption, so impingement, persistent diplopia in primary gaze, if 50% of the floor is gone, really on the, um, the CT, if there's V2, hypesthesia, and then abnormal force duction testing. So really you need to assess for all of the periorbital injuries that can be associated with this and be not being afraid to bring on board ophthalmology if there's any concern. Um, really, uh, mid-face sensory testing for V2 is important, just like in the mandibular um, trauma talk that we discussed. V3 numbness should be documented. V2 numbness, again, should be documented here. So if you happen to fix this and you don't document that there was preoperative V2 numbness, they're going to assume that you have that. Um, force duction testing is something that I've never actually done, but um, I normally leave that up to the ophthalmologist. But Technically, you can anesthetize the, the eye with a drop 
um, if there's concern for entrapment, then perform a force duction testing. It is something that is routinely done in the operating room prior to and after orbital wall fractures or floor fractures are repaired. Um, and the discharge recommendations over here on the right really are targeted at the reduction of periorbital edema and avoidance of progressive air emphysema. So steroids, antibiotics, lubricating eye drops, ice, um, head of bed elevation, avoiding Valsalva and follow up with one week is advised. In the same vein as our orbital wall fractures and ocular trauma, we need to be concerned about retroorbital hematoma. So the cardinal symptoms for retroorbital hematoma is painful proptosis, increased intraocular pressures, which can be assessed via tonopen, echomosis of the eyelids, chemosis, decreased visual acuity of fields or complete loss of vision, and then an afferent pupillary defect. So the differentiation between an arterial and venous bleed can be drastic as which an arterial bleed is going to have more aggressive symptoms and a more aggressive nature with a acute onset of some of these symptoms. So an orbital hematoma generally has an, about a 90 minute window is what was quoted. So if this happens after trauma and there happens to be nasal packing, you want to remove the nasal packing, elevate the head of the bed, have a cool compress, manage the blood pressure, measure the intraocular pressures. You want an ophthalmology consultation as uh, common or as soon as possible. Uh, um, eye massage is sometimes um, advised if there is uh, intranasal injury to redistribute the blood and reduce pressure, and then a lateral cantholomy and cantholysis is required. So that is something that you should you know, be familiar with all of the steps of and how to do it efficiently. Medications that can be adjuncts that aren't something that we're typically going to be involved in, but important to know, mannitol, uh, steroids can't hurt, acetazolamide, and some timolol eye drops. Intranasal decompression of the orbit can be performed. Generally, this is not you know, the, the first option as a cantholotomy and cantholysis. Medial decompression via external or transcorrunkular approach is generally done by ophthalmology. Optic nerve decompression, again, not something really within our training, and then postoperative uh, CT or MRI. But generally, getting ophthalmology on board after you have either temporized with a cantholotomy or cantholysis or simply diagnosing it. The next traumatic emergency that we'll talk about is relatively broad, and that's penetrating neck trauma. So really penetrating neck trauma is defined as anything that is deep to the platysma, and it's generally differentiated into different zones in the neck. So we'll see zone one, two, and three. So zone one is from the clavicles to the cricoid cartilage. Zone two is from the cricoid cartilage and mandibular angle. And then anywhere above the mandibular angle to the skull base is considered zone three. And then some of the symptoms and signs can be broken up into hard and soft signs. The soft signs are things that are kind of nondescript, dysphonia, dysphagia, maybe non-expanding hematoma, um, hemoptysis, hematemesis, but the hard signs are the ones that you really need to watch out for, and those will maybe dictate what are the next steps if that's operative intervention or you need uh, further consultation. So expanding hematoma, severe active bleeding, if they're in shock that's not responding to fluid, so um, uh, absent radial pulses, vascular bruise, thrills, ischemia, or an airway obstruction would be all um, considered hard signs if you ever hear that term. Beginning inferiorly with zone one, which starts at the clavicles and ascends to the cricoid cartilage. If the patient is symptomatic, then vascular evaluation with CT angiogram of the chest and neck or surgical exploration. If there is injury, then either sternotomy or thoracotomy to control a hemorrhage and trauma, vascular CT surgery might be indicated. Again, there are algorithms that you can read about that go through each appropriate next step after uh, evaluation of the zones and the symptoms or image findings that are found. So if the patient is asymptomatic or either once the hemorrhage is uh, controlled, then a thorough evaluation of the esophagus and other air digestive tracts should be initiated. Um, contrast esophagram or swallow study can be employed, remembering the difference between gastrographin, which is thinner, less sensitive than barium, versus barium, which is thicker, but may identify smaller injuries, missed, but more likely to cause massive irritation or reaction. So that is one reason why you might want to start with gastrographin followed by barium. So as we further ascend into the neck, we encounter zone two. If the patient is symptomatic from penetrating neck injury to zone two, proceeding to the OR for neck exploration, DL, bronchoscopy, esophagoscopy, either repairing injuries with stents, keels, um, vascular surgery consultation for vessel repair, um, or if um, they're asymptomatic, then 
there still is a lower threshold for surgical exploration just because we're used to accessing the midline portion uh, of the neck and there's reduced morbidity of the surgery. But if there is any concern for vascular injury, getting a CT angiogram of the, of the neck would be uh, a next step. If there's large vessel injury, then going again to the OR for neck exploration. There should be a detailed nasopharyngoscopy portion of the examination to assess the function for a vagal or recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, for example, if there's a true vocal fold immobility. But sometimes arytenoid dislocation could be a mimicker here. Um, so that's why direct laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, and the OR is generally advised for zone 2 injuries, even in the absence of symptoms. And then our most superior zone is zone 3. If the patient is symptomatic, can, uh, consider getting IR to perform a catheterization just because this is when we start to abut the skull base and these vessels are really hard to reach via transcervical approach. A therapeutic or diagnostic angiogram may be employed. Um, if not, there are techniques that we can access these high skull base type of uh, lesions, but that may require mandibulotomy or distraction techniques for access, which are somewhat antiquated. If the patient is asymptomatic, then there still should be a low threshold for a diagnostic angiogram or a di diagnostic four vessel type of test, which would include bilateral carotid and vertebral arteries. If there is any concern for pharyngeal involvement, then a thorough examination of the oral cavity, oral pharynx, supraglottis, and larynx with DL and nasopharyngoscopy. And again, low threshold for swallow studies prior to any diet initiation because a esophageal injury could lead to mediastinitis, which could be a devastating outcome for a patient. Although this isn't your typical penetrating neck trauma case, this is an interesting consult that I had as a P2I2 in which a female was shot at point blank in her left cheek. So you'll see a lot of disruption of the left maxillary sinus with some bullet fragments. You can see the bullet fragments traversing the pterygopalatine fossa, intra infratemporal fossa as well. And then if you look within the middle ear, in the temporal bone, you can actually see a large ballistic fragment sitting within the ear canal. This patient unfortunately required immediate intravascular approach to embolize her sphenopalatine artery. She did have complete deafness on her left side and she did have complete House Brockman 6 facial nerve paralysis. She unfortunately was left, uh, left AMA from the hospital after extubation and she did not return for any follow-up. Here are some other interesting consultations at our pediatric hospital for penetrating neck trauma. The first one that you'll see on the left side is a young girl who is running with a comb in her mouth that has this um, pointed end for styling her hair. She ultimately tripped and ended up lodging the end of this comb in her posterior oral pharynx. You can see the trajectory is obviously in a concerning location for large vessel injury. She was not exhibiting any hard signs or any symptoms whatsoever. Although a little tearful, she was in good spirits. So we decided to merely pull this out at bedside. Her first words were thank you, and she was discharged home after some observ observation. And then up on the right here, a similar story, but a child was um, running around his house with a toothbrush in his mouth, and he ended up kind of performing a partial tonsillectomy and puncturing his superior pillar. Again, a little uh, silver nitrate for hemostasis, but otherwise did not require any operative intervention. Then moving on to one of the more interesting and severe cases of penetrating neck trauma. This was a patient who had attempted to commit suicide with a chainsaw to her neck and had basically created a laceration from her ear to her other ear, exposing clearly through the platysma muscle. You can see the bellies of the digastric muscles here and the submandibular glands on either side and obviously some plant material uh, which were required washout. Fortunately, after neck exploration, she did not have any airway or aerodigestive tract involvement. So merely, you know, closing these muscles and putting drains in place were uh, all she needed, fortunately. We did use nerve monitoring in case of marginal mandibular nerve involvement. Fortunately, there was only bilateral greater auricular nerve involvement identified. Moving forward to salivary gland abscesses. So parotid abscesses may extend into the peripharyngeal space as we discussed before, but also they can communicate with surrounding neck spaces. Generally, if they're in the parotid, they are multiloculated, as you can see in this lower CT of a left parotid abscess. Uh, CAT scan is usually used to diagnose and differentiate from either sialadenitis or parotitis. You should 
be on the lookout for a distal stone that can cause these similar symptoms of a parotid abscess and can be the causative agent for obstruction. Um, needle aspiration versus formal IND uh, can be employed, but careful for facial nerve injury. And then figuring out where the parotid duct is in relation to the surrounding structures. We can see the masseter muscle here. And then if we form a triangle formed by the buccinator muscle, the zygomaticus muscle, in the middle would be the facial vein, and then that posterior limb of the triangle is always the parotid duct. So you might not be able to easily see it here, but you can see the zygomaticus muscle here, the masseter, the same buccinator muscle, the facial vein, and then the, um, the duct itself is just running over. And then moving towards salivary duct injury, your suspicion should be high if there's trauma to the anatomic region of Stenson's or Wharton's duct. So remembering that if you draw an imaginary line from the tragus to the philtrum, that's basically where a parotid duct is going to traverse. Remembering that our facial nerve uh, branches are within proximity here. Knowing where to find the papilla is important as well. Remember just lateral and adjacent to the premolar. Assessment of facial nerve branch injury with parotid duct injury should be also employed. Um, some of the physical exam findings that could be associated with salivary duct injury are clear and constant drainage um, from a laceration or an intraoral laceration that's worse when eating. If you happen to collect the uh, drainage, it can be amylase positive, which remember is a protein found in saliva. Generally conservative measures are going to be employed first, including anti-salagogues, so scopolamine, glycopyrrolate, pressure dressing, IV antibiotics if there's infection or for prophylaxis. And if there's concern for either facial nerve injury or if there's failure for conservative measures, exploration with either reanastomosis or stent or diversion would be needed. And then our final ENT traumatic emergency would be a combination of either inhalational injury, burns, or toxic ingestion. So this can be from both thermal and chemical exposure. An important fact is to know that edema is expected to worsen within the first 24 hours and then small hematomas may progress if time goes on, so therefore serial examinations are generally required. Again, maintaining a very low threshold for securing an airway in any of these patients. The signs that you'll see included would be this um, singed appearance to the nasal hairs, either facial or oral burns, dysphagia, dysphonia, strider, and then you know this black char-like sputum might be seen within bronchoscopy. Um, evaluation. So burn inhalation treatment, which would be more catered towards a burn center, could include aerosolized heparin and acetylcysteine albuterol. And then where we are um, would dictate whether or not transfer to a burn center should be um, thought about. So Crozier is one system that does have a burn center. Next we'll be going over the ENT airway emergencies, starting with Strider. So the first ENT airway emergency is a word that will definitely bring you to the ER. Okay, as I have in red here, it's one of the few words that when spoken or documented by anyone in the hospital, you as the ENT are basically obligated to see the, the patient. And although the word will be thrown out, most commonly it's not really Strider in reality, but one of those things that you have to basically rule out. So when you hear the word strider, that represents a multitude of possible etiologies that can lead to noisy breathing. So I have a broad differential up here of inspiratory strider, expiratory strider, and biphasic strider. So really strider is defined as a medium to high pitched musical respiratory sound, usually with inspiration that represents resistance to airflow through the upper airway. So I have a, a sound clip over here that you can hear it. So this is a biphasic strider, but inspiratory strider generally represents a supraglottic obstruction. Biphasic strider represents glottic or subglottic or proximal tracheal obstruction. And then expiratory strider, more commonly called expiratory wheeze, is a distal tracheal or bronchial obstruction. And then we'll go through um, some of their examples of strider. These examples were all shot on the endoscope eye. We'll go through each one of them and the associated diagnosis. So we can see here very limited abduction bilaterally of the true vocal folds with inspiration and expiration. So our diagnosis there is bilateral vocal fold paralysis. That would be at the level of the glottis. So either a biphasic or an inspiratory type of strider. The next examination, let's go through into the nasopharynx. And then we can see movement of the left vocal fold, which is on the right side of the screen, but really no movement of the right, no jostle sign. So 
or having a right-sided unilateral vocal fold paralysis. This was an intubated COVID patient. So we can see a narrowed glottic inlet, relative limited abduction. This is posterior glottic uh, stenosis and glottic stenosis. And then finally, this one's pretty obvious, is there is circumferential loss of diameter of the subglottis or trachea. So that's subglottic stenosis. Next in our ENT airway emergencies is angioedema. Angioedema is a common consultation within our location and our patient population. This is a consult that you essentially need to see all of them um, given the risk of rapidly progressing edema and otherwise you know, innocuous edema that may impact the airway. There is a known biphasic response that can be present in certain cases. Therefore, we recommend general admission or an observation for several hours to ensure that the edematous response has decreased. So when we talk to the consulting team, recommendation placement of IV, oxygen, telemetry status with continuous pulse ox, NPO, and then whether or not there's concern of an airway issue, that placement of an airway cart or the NPO would be advised by the patient's room. If there is significant supraglottic edema on airway evaluation, then simply proceeding with intubation for um, airway protection would be the next step. Or if that's not possible, then a surgical airway would be required. If a patient comes in with purely supraglottic or tongue edema that is mild, then recommending the same types of things with close observation and having the necessary supplies at, at bedside if there's acute decompensation. For nearly all patients, IV steroids, PPI, H1 blocker like Benadryl, and H2 blocker like Pepsid, nebulizer, systemic epinephrine, and elevation of the head of bed, all are adjuncts, none of which have really been shown to be helpful in most cases of angioedema. Like I said, in our population, it's likely related to the ACE inhibitor use that's popular um, within the African-American community. Laboratory evaluation, which isn't something that is necessarily up to us to order or to interpret, but general labs like CBC, CMP, ESR, CRP, and then certain C1 esterase inhibitor levels, C4 complement levels, in consideration of tryptase are also recommended. The differential of angioedema can be broad, but generally broken down into the following. Acute allergic angioedema, which is purely an allergic reaction. Non-allergic angioedema, which is ASIN, somewhat uncommonly ARB-induced. Idiopathic edema, which is of unknown cause. And then several forms of hereditary or familial angioedema, 
one of which which is C1 protein deficiency or an antibody to C1 protein or a inhibitor mutation of C1. And then last, there is an acquired form of angioedema that is histamine mediated, mediated or antibodies that destroy the C1 inhibitor. These would be the ones that would benefit from the steroid, the Benadryl, the H2 blocker. So typically this is the airway uh, examination that we see with angioedema. You can somewhat make out the edematous right trubocal fold extending to the aryepiglottic fold. Normal water bag appearance with bulky edematous tissue is indicative of angioedema in the right clinical setting. On the right here would be a picture that is pretty jarring to most, especially the emergency room or the hospital consultation team. This is a clinical entity that, at least in my opinion, is not as worrisome. So for whatever reason, if there's some anatomic boundary that separates the lips from the oral cavity, it seems to take place within the angioedema setting. So isolated lip edema is not as concerning to me as something that would be more concerning, like a patient like this who would have no lip edema at all, but massive floor of mouth and tongue edema. So just like in our talk about Ludwig's angina, how the enlargement of the tongue or retro displacement of the tongue can lead to airway compromise, this is the same situation. And in this case, this patient was um, fiber optically nasotracheally intubated because there was no airway really from the oral cavity. Another common ENT airway emergency is tracheostomy decannulation, more specifically, accidental tracheostomy decannulation, meaning this is not a planned decannulation attempt from any ENT team or provider. This is the clinical scenario in which a tracheostomy has been inadvertently removed. So the goal, in my opinion, is to get the trach back in the tracheostoma and discharge the patient from the emergency room. That's gonna be the quickest resolution in, in terms of getting the patient back home or back to the nursing facility, assuming they don't have any other ENT problems or general medical problems. If the tract is completely closed, then you should assess the airway from above. If you're unable to get the trach back in, then admission to the overnight observation step-down unit or ICU is required. You should do a upper airway evaluation in all causes just to make sure that there is patency from above if you are going to leave the patient without the trach or you're not able to replace the trach. Remember that the tracheostoma can close relatively quickly over the period of several hours to several days. If a trach tracheotomy tube is out of place, that stoma can relatively quickly close up and you might not be able to easily pass a tracheotomy tube in. There are multiple techniques for trach replacement. In my opinion, the best and the one that has worked best for me and the one that I use exclusively at this point is the blue rhino dilator that comes with the percutaneous tracheotomy kit. This is a single-use type of device that is used to allow percutaneous traits to take place. It's not commonplace in ENT, at least within our institution, to do percutaneous tracheotomies, but I find this device pretty useful. It is tapered at the end. It is relatively smooth and silicone and flexible. It has a skin guide level that allows you to determine the appropriate um, length that the tracheotomy tube is going to go in, and it gives you visual and auditory uh, confirmation that you're in the airway when you have spewing of blood out the end of this and the patient's coughing. Not to say that this can't inadvertently end up in the mediastinum, but I have not had that happen and I generally don't need to use any anesthetic at all. I don't need to uh, serially dilate. This is basically one pass with this large uh, blue rhino dilator and, and that does it for me and I'm able to quickly exchange uh, back to the patient's trach. Other techniques include a nasal speculum or ear speculum there is significant force that is required and most commonly brisk bleeding that is encountered with the above techniques. But again, the blue diet later, if you have those within your disposal, are very useful and very quick. This is a short slide just as reference in terms of different airway size uh, diameters with standard Shiley tracheotomy tubes, Bavona, and cupless tubes, and then different dimensions in terms of comparison by brand. And then remembering that you can always resort to an endotracheal tube of smaller diameter that may be more suitable for a patient if you're unable to get a standard tracheotomy tube in place. And if all else resort or fails and they have an airway from above, you can always intubate from above and then do a revision tracheotomy at a later date. Next in our ENT airway emergencies would be laryngeal masses and cancer. Within our patient population, we do have a high incidence of patients presenting to the emergency room in distress in late stage undiagnosed head and neck cancer. So most of these patients, as I said, present later stage 
and are within need for urgent or emergent airway management. So this can span between awake trach methods, standard intubation, fiber optic intubation. This is all really at the discretion of the attending provider, but more importantly, really what the patient is most likely to successfully undergo. So in the patient that requires an awake trach, this would be someone that has a relatively tenuous airway, is not acutely decompensating, but there would be fear that the airway would not be as likely successful if the patient was um, anesthetized in a general manner, therefore keeping the patient relatively awake and slightly sedated with local anesthesia and performing an awake trach versus standard, intuba standard intubation that the anesthetist would perform versus fiber optic intubation, which the ENT or the, the experienced anesthetist would perform. If the patient does have a neck mass to expedite the workup for definitive treatment, performing fine needle aspiration is never a bad thing, especially in the case of total laryngectomy. You would also need to have a comprehensive CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to evaluate for metastatic disease. Um, at least within our institutions in the United States, PET scans usually are not done inpatient or without diagnosis of cancer. And then remembering that the timing of trach to total laryngectomy is important in terms of stomal recurrence. So you can see a large neck mass here that is basically in continuity with a primary cancer, the larynx. And then here would be a ENT evaluation, fiber optic, NPL scope of a left-sided, somewhat superglottic or transglottic tumor, noting the vocal fold immobility on the left, the narrowed airway lumen, trying to figure out what your next plan would be for airway management. This was a patient who presented to the emergency room, undiagnosed head and neck cancer, progressive shortness of breath and strider, and someone who, after this evaluation, was taken to the operating room in which an awake trach was performed, and then several days later, total laryngectomy, bilateral neck dissection was performed after negative evaluation for metastatic disease. Yet again, another common ENG airway emergency would be the pharyngeal foreign body. Generally, in our institutions and within our patient population, these are bones of some sort, generally fish bones, chicken or pork bones, or sometimes plastic, inorganic materials or organic materials. Sometimes these can be visualized on x-ray, but generally not unless they're large or relatively ossified. The common locations are the tonsil, the tongue base, the vallecula, piriform sinus, sinus, and esophageal inlet. If these areas happen to be within the oral cavity or posterior oral pharynx, a hemostat is generally the tool of choice in my opinion. For example, you can see a fish bone sticking out of the superpolar tonsil, which would be easily retrieved at bedside. If the foreign body is further down within the airway, piriform sinus, esophageal inlet, in my opinion, a McGill forceps, which is a curved, uh, longer instrument that is generally stocked within the airway cart or for anesthesia. For example, you can see a left-sided piriform sinus fish bone that was removed at bedside. If bedside attempts fail or the patient is not a candidate, then going to the OR for definitive removal. If the patient does have a negative CAT scan, X-ray, and NPL, in my opinion, most of the symptoms that a patient is attributing to are mucosal scratches. So when a patient swallows a, uh, a foreign body or has a mucosal scratch, they misidentify this as a foreign body that is still in place. And what we can do is basically rule out any foreign body on imaging and NPL and then offering reassurance, a PPI, which may or may not actually help, and then strict return uh, procedures to the ED if Symptoms persist over days or get worse. So related to the pharyngeal foreign body is the evaluation of what a normal lateral neck x-ray and an anterior uh, posterior neck x-ray looks like. Knowing that there are different patterns and degrees of ossification of our laryngeal cartilages and bones. And here is just a normal lateral neck x-ray with some variation that you should be aware of. Then there's a great article referenced below that goes through some of the mimics of foreign bodies on lateral neck x-rays. There are different patterns of ossification within the laryngeal cartilages as discussed before. There can be calcified lymph nodes or calcified uh, ligaments, particularly the stylohyoid ligament. Um, there can be different variations within the ossification patterns of the cricoid cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, the different corna, 
and um, even some anterior cervical osteophytes that can be abnormally pushing into the airway or misidentified as foreign bodies. And even calcified tracheal cartilages can be misidentified as foreign bodies. So this was an example of a lateral neck x-ray that I had gotten consulted from an adult male who had foreign body sensation after eating fish. And the on-call radiologist had read this area just posterior to the thyroid cartilage, a possible foreign body. On closer inspection and evaluation, this was not indicative of a foreign body to me. And just superior to that area that I will outline a little bit more, you can see a large fish bone that was clinically apparent as well and able to be retrieved at bedside. So this just kind of outlines the importance of understanding all of the variants and really knowing more than the radiologist about head and neck radiology. Here are some other examples of patients that I had encountered with foreign bodies. Here is a small video of a child in which bedside removal of a molecular foreign body was made and then other airway foreign bodies that were identified and either removed, this one was removed in the operating room, and then these ones were removed with a combination of McGill forceps or hemostat. Next in the ENT airway emergencies is the airway foreign body, which is more commonly seen within our pediatric population. The biggest thing here is that it's imperative to differentiate coins from button batteries um, because button batteries are a true emergency and need, need to re be removed as soon as possible because there are some de devastating outcomes that can occur over time. If there is a witness versus unwitnessed aspiration event, that's a, a key point within the clinical history that can change management. There should be a high suspicion of a foreign body, an airway foreign body in particular, with a child who has newly diagnosed asthma. There are differences in the clinical response um, of the foreign body, if it's organic or inorganic materials, sometimes peanuts or other nuts that have resins or oils can cause a bronchitis type of picture. The choice of grasper is also important. If you can figure out exactly what the foreign body is before look, looking at it or, or seeing it on lateral neck x-ray, that will kind of expedite the process of getting it out within the operating room. There are different graspers, certain ones that have teeth at the end of it that are better for coins, certain ones that are um, have different angulation or grips for peanuts and things like that. So getting comfortable with the different choices of uh, optical forceps and graspers. Here's an image of a bead that can be easily removed with a Fogarty catheter or a um, other cardiac balloon stent um, type of device if your hospital has those. So simply putting the Fogarty catheter um, distal and within the hole of the, of the bead um, hole and then removing the whole bead and bronchoscope and block. Here was an interesting case of a patient who had not necessarily an airway foreign body, but just in the esophageal inlet, it was a 68 year old female who had newly diagnosed MS and was still on a relatively normal diet and had been able to partially swallow a piece of breakfast sausage. This was removed at bedside with combination of a endoscope eye and then a McGill forceps. And it's imperative to know how to set up the rigid bronchoscope in the OR table, which we'll talk about. And then we'll go more into the specifics of the um, button battery on imaging. The Mayo Clinic YouTube channel does have a terrific video outlining the different steps of setting up a rigid bronchoscope table for airway foreign body retrieval. This is something that should be second nature and something that you're able to efficiently set up within several minutes in the middle of the night because that's generally when these types of uh, consultations will happen. So here's a short chart um, on the appropriate bronchoscope size or esophagoscope size based on the patient's age. The esophageal foreign body can be handled differently depending on the institution that you work at, the GI presence or the attending that you're working at if you're a resident, 
The general symptoms include drooling, retrosternal pain. Sometimes there can be airway symptoms associated with air, uh, aerodigestive foreign bodies or esophageal foreign bodies, and then odynophagia. And again, evaluating for these airway symptoms is important because anterior pressure on the trachea and associated edema can cause airway issues. And an esophageal foreign body can be aspirated if there is accidental dislodgement. The common locations for esophageal foreign bodies to get stuck are the cricopharyngeus, the aortic, aortic arch, left main stem bronchus, and lower esophageal sphincter. Watchful waiting until it's in the stomach is appropriate in otherwise stable patients with dis, uh, a benign distal foreign body, but again, referring to the particular algorithm that the hospital um, is set forth or you're attending. You can also consider glucagon IV, which is an adjunct that can allow the lower esophageal sphincter to relax and sometimes is quoted to have um, better transit within esophageal foreign bodies. If there's any concern for perforation, then IV antibiotics, PPI, serial imaging, either a gastrographin uh, challenge or a barium swallow, CT surgery consultation, CT of the chest, and then positive, uh, possible operative intervention. So everyone knows the difference between an esophageal and a airway uh, coin in terms of the orientation within AP and lateral imaging. This represents an esophageal foreign body. Here's the typical location or the, the visualization that either the anesthetist or you're going to get within either a Miller, a Mac, or an esoph esophagus scope. Typically, you're not going to get as great of a picture of the esophageal lumen or the inlet. Generally, a coin is stuck right within this place, and when the anesthetist is trying to secure the airway, they'll ask for a McGill or some other grasper and then remove the coin, and then you don't really have the satisfaction of relieving the patient of the foreign body. So this was an interesting lateral neck and AP x-ray on a consult that I got in the middle of the night during my second year. This was a 87-year-old demented female who presented with dysphagia and missing an earring. And lo and behold, this represented her left hoop earring that was inadvertently swallowed and um, was retrieved with rigid esophagoscopy in the operating room. So one of the true airway emergencies in terms of foreign bodies is button batteries. Um, if there is any suspicion whatsoever, this should be treated as such and expedited removal in the operating room with the appropriate next steps. So there are characteristic radiographic features that everyone knows about, the halo sign or the step-off sign. Occasionally two coins, either a dime and a nickel, can also mimic this as well if they're kind of stacked uh, on top of one another. It's important to know that there is a national button battery ingested hotline um, that is useful in terms of getting some uh, appropriate next steps or, or facilitating transfer. If the patient is at home or en route to the emergency room, you can advise honey that has been shown to reduce the chemical injury. And consideration of acetic acid irrigations, which is vinegar postoperatively to decrease chemical injury. This was a newly or relatively newer um, paper that was published within the laryngoscope about this neutralization uh, technique. It's important to differentiate the anode from the cathode as well. On imaging and esophagoscopy, this might sound like kind of a trivial type of task, but really knowing that the shorter side of the button battery is the anode, and that's the side that's going to have most of the liquefactive necrosis and chemical injury. Therefore, you can kind of predict where the location in follow-up is most likely to have injury. So keeping this uh, in mind and using it in the post-operative period to plan or expect what degree or location of injury is present is something um, to, to routinely document if you see these button batteries. Next, one of the most feared ENT consults if you are in-house or nearby is the clinical entity of cannot intubate and cannot ven ventilate. So our options here that I could think of are the following. So transtracheal ventilation, which might not be something that we're all too familiar about, but knowing that there is options within the emergency room setting, um, depending on your institution to do this. Transcricothyroid membrane ventilation, same type of technique, just in a different location. Cricothyroidotomy or a cric, we all know about that. Open tracheotomy, percutaneous tracheotomy, which is not routinely done by ENTs, at least within our institution, and ECMO, which is not something that we are familiar with, but knowing that that's an option. So remembering our anatomy and reviewing really where the cricothyroid membrane is and the steps of doing a cricothyroidotomy are important. Here is just a brief little 
um, animation type of uh, illustration for the transtracheal ventilation. There are nifty airway ventilation techniques or um, instruments that some ERs might have. There's a particular device called the vent drain, pictured here. Knowing the minimal amount of tools that you would need to perform either a cricothyroidotomy or an open tracheotomy, so some sort of knife um, at its basis, some sort of retractor, maybe a cric hook, and then either a endotracheal tube or a tracheotomy um, tube would be necessary. And then again, it's very crucial to review the anatomy indications steps of a emergent surgical airway frequently because this is something that you don't really plan for. It's just one of those things that you get caught in the middle of and you need to be able to efficiently and effectively perform a surgical airway if needed as the ENT resident. So here are some of the disaster patients that may require the um, emergent airway. So starting on the left here, here's an endoscope eye picture uh, video of a patient who again presented late stage to the emergency room, undiagnosed head and neck cancer. You can see basically a large fungi lesion. Good. Can you take a deep breath? No real landmarks visualized. Stick out your tongue way wide. This patient fortunately was able to undergo an awake tracheotomy, but if there were bleeding or any complications of this, so an emergent airway fiber fiber optic. performed. Yeah. No, yeah. In the middle here is a say, patient with a large e. lymphoma. E. Yeah, it's like curled and then around. The last patient right. here. One more time. Just something to keep Deep in breath mind. In is and e. and looking hold. at the patient's e. anatomy, e. not only of the e. neck, but also the nose. Yeah. This patient would be very hard to nasotracheally intubate to the left nostril. So keeping those things in mind, and we'll go over some tips and tricks about how to prepare for fiber optic intubation. And then another picture here of a patient who presented to our trauma ER following a ATV accident on the road without a helmet. Um, polyfacial trauma, uh, you can see some distracted and uh, comminuted mandibular segments here and a lot of just panfacial trauma. Unsure how the ER was able to you know, secure an airway, but this would be one that if you had stumbled across this, your first thought would be, let's prep the neck and get ready for a possible surgical airway. So some fiber optic intubation technique or tips. Um, the questions that I kind of ask myself are as follows. So decision for awake versus sedated. As we alluded to before, a awake fiber optic is always safer than a sedated. Um, when the anesthetic is given, sometimes the airway tissues and muscles can kind of collapse and flop and that allows an ex a bit of obscured view of the airway to then make the securement of the airway pretty difficult. So, um, you know, if you decide to do the awake, you need to have the anesthetic and decongestant choices um, at hand, such as nebulized 4%, topical 4% lidocaine, lidocaine jelly, and afrin. And then your decision should be transoral versus transnasal. Patient positioning, keeping them more in a supine position and in a, you know, a seated position is always best. Marping, marking, prepping, and injecting the neck is something that I routinely do just to uh, make myself feel comfortable. And also in the emergent situation, it's nice to have some lidocaine on board when cutting into the neck. A Ovisapien or Berman airway as seen above can be adjuncts in terms of securing an airway from a oral route. And here are the differences in the views of those. Nasal trumpets can be used to dilate a nasal cavity prior to nasotracheal intubation. A bougie or a cook catheter can allow ventilation or can uh, be used as a more rigid type of stylet to secure an airway. If a video bronchoscope is used, there needs to be some consideration on securing the endotracheal tube to the end of it prior to you know, actually inserting the endotracheal tube. So either having someone hold it or tape it or using a rubber band in this technique is, is something that you need to think about. And then the endotracheal tube size and type. So starting out, there are different forms of ray tubes. So there are nasal rays that have different bends for anatomic position. There are oral rays, which we really wouldn't use within these types of techniques. MLTs, which are for uh, microlaryngoscopy types of tubes, but knowing that they're a lot longer is also important to know. Next, we'll transition from our airway emergencies and go through some post-op emergencies that I could think of. So starting with post-tonsillectomy hemorrhage and then dysphagia and then our rhinologic types of hemorrhages, post-op hypocalcemia, hematoma, and local and free flap emergencies.
starting off with post tonsillectomy hemorrhage, this is a very common clinical entity that you'll see if you do a lot of uh, pediatric tonsillectomies or even adult tonsillectomies. The incidence can be high as 5% in some institutions. Remembering that our attendings and sites may have different opinions on how to manage a post tonsillectomy hemorrhage. Remembering that a primary tonsillectomy hemorrhage occurs within 24 hours and the secondary is most commonly seen within the 10, 7 to 10 day period post-op as when the uh, scab of the tonsillar fossa falls off. If the patient is at home, advising all patients really to come to the ER for evaluation is my um, best practice. There's really no such thing as a stable clot in my opinion. If there's a clot seen, then those patients need to be observed or need to be taken to the operating room for evacuation and hemostasis. This is a typical uh, post tonsillectomy fossa type of appearance, remembering that there is going to be a whitish exudate seen and reassuring to the parents that this doesn't represent infection. And then when you do see a clot, there is a dark area uh, generally within either the superior or inferior pole of the tonsil. And in this example, this is not an active bleed. Bedside silver nitrate is an option for the brave. I will say that I have done that successfully once, but not something that I would necessarily try for all of these patients. Routinely uh, getting an IV, obtaining labs, particularly a H&H &H and a Titan screen, are routine within our institutions. You can consider observation in the ER or on the floor if there's no active bleeding. If the clot dislodges and no further bleeding, then they go home. If there's persistent um, or bleeding of the clot, then they need to go to the operating room. So some important facts to know when in the operating room, you should be ready the second the patient gets into the operating room. So having a headlight on, gown and gloves, two suctions, the tonsil tray ready, a suction bobby, and then some sort of suture is important. So you should be prepared to have very large volume blood loss. So the patient can look stable, the clot can be there for you know several hours without any bleeding, but the second that anesthesia tries to perform intubation, they can dislodge the clot or the kid can cough during a, a rapid sequence intubation and then large volume blood loss can occur. You should be prepared to assist in intubation because the blood can rapidly obscure the view for the anesthetist. Um, you can calm down once the airway is secured. You can stop any type of bleeding afterwards, but really the nerve-wracking portion of a tonsillectomy bleed is securing the airway in some point. So suction bovi, pillar suturing, figure of eight stitch, and more extreme types of situations, transcervical ligation has been offered, and then IR can also be thought of. It's important to perform multiple passes of the OG tube following hemorrhage control. This helps with post-op nausea and vomiting. There can be large volume or slow uh, oozes that the child can swallow a lot of blood and evacuating this from the stomach can be, help, uh, can be helpful post-operatively. And then this is just an example of uh, a basin that you can see um, how much blood can really quickly uh, accumulate after a post tonsillectomy hemorrhage. So this was within my first year of training. I had just completed a tonsillectomy. And if you look on the left side of the screen, the left tonsillar fossa, just posterior to it is a pulsatile mass. And this can represent a retropharyngeal carotid, which can be seen as a normal variant uh, in children, particularly in the velocardiofacial syndrome, um, but also can be seen within the elderly population as the torturous calcified carotid artery can make some different turns and become retropharyngeal. So one thing to always kind of look out for and be wary of the pulsatile tonsil. So next is post tonsillectomy dysphagia. This isn't described elsewhere, but something that I have seen a lot and I've gotten calls about, particularly in our pediatric population. So for example, you are called from PACU, uh, from the nurse who is with the child that had just undergone tonsillectomy a few hours ago, and now the child is inconsolable. They're putting their fingers in their mouth. There's muffled voice. Um, you know, what, what do we think is going on? So this would be the, the typical picture. So you can see the uvula is essentially the size of a grape, and the child is, you know, in distress and, and kind of choking on this big uvula and trying to grab whatever is in there out. And really the culprit is the red rubber catheter. So we're all taught to use the red rubbers in this manner to sling up the soft palate uh, for adenoidectomy and to assist with the superior pole dissection. And then this is our typical view when we're using the dental mirror. So we can see the two red rubbers slinging the soft palate. We can see the vomer. We can see the turbinates. We can see the adenoid pad, which there isn't really any. We can see our tonsils here and then our endotracheal tube. And then if we move a little superiorly, we can see that the poor uvula is being strangulated from this 
technique. So really limiting either the amount of pressure that you're pulling up with the red rubbers. In my opinion, I'm only using one red rubber um, for all of my cases, if one at all. Um, and just one of those things that you need to be considerate and make sure that the uvula isn't getting too uh, devascularized or edematous by the end of the case. If so, there is a consideration to remove the uvula. Um, but more often than not, giving some time, maybe some popsicles or you know some cool drink and uh, just consoling the patient, this will eventually go down. But one of those things that we can generally avoid if possible. Next in our bleeding emergencies is the post-septoplasty, turbidoplasty, or thes hemorrhage. So in my opinion, there are some differences between typical epistaxis um, with some considerations that we can talk about. So the post-op day is important. So if it's post-op day one and there's a large amount of bleeding, more than you're expecting, that is of concern. Generally, the patient is going to call with some concerns about bleeding, saturation of a nasal dressing. If this is, you know, a couple of times within the first few days, this is okay. But really advising the patient that some amount of bleeding is normal, pressure, afrin, nasal saline, and then reassurance. If during the case a resected middle turbinate was uh, performed, then you need to think about the insertion point, point of the uh, middle turbinate and the SPA region. You can see on this illustration of a right-sided nasal cavity, status post-maxillary sinus uh, antrostomy, and then the middle turbinate as it's curving towards its horizontal portion of the basal lamella, inserting into the lateral nasal wall. That's where our sphenopalatine artery can be. So inadvertent injury can occur either with aggressive middle turbinate resection or with aggressive posterior fontanelle resection of a maxillary antrostomy. If the, turbin, uh, the turbinate is bleeding after reduction or turbinectomy, Starting to think about whether or not it's the head of the inferior turbinate, which can happen after a stab incision um, if a microdebrider was used, or the posterior attachment of the middle turbinate with the inferior turbinate artery from the sphenopalatine artery. If there's packing or splints in place, this may limit your view and your ability to identify the bleed, so you should either remove this or place additional packing in after you address the bleed. If high ethmoid dissection has occurred, think about the anterior ethmoid artery injury. If there's catastrophic bleeding and there is, uh, you know, there was dissection within the sphenoid, then start to think about the carotid artery. This should be kind of a rare clinical entity, but something that can occur. If there's persistent bleeding, either going to the operating room to get a formal look or even consideration of SPA ligation or embolization from IR. In any head and neck surgery, you want to be aware of the post-operative hematoma that can occur. So general risk factors, males, older age, smoking diabetes, antiplatelet or anticoagulation use, hepatorenal insufficiency, or any congenital or acquired thrombophilic condition, some basic methods to reduce the risk that we all know about, operative uh, techniques to minimize you know, um, large vessel injury, judicious drain placement, post-operative drain management, use of compressive dressing, the symptoms of a hematoma are generally fluctuant or firm expansion of tissues that surrounds the confines of the operative space with or without ecchymosis and with and without pain. A seroma is a different entity but may look similarly but is normally in a different time frame. This is a delayed fashion one week after surgery. You can see a seroma um, accumulating here. The general practice is not to really mess with, mess with these and allow them to drain spontaneously or to resorb if the patient is having um, concerning symptoms, then you can perform a needle aspiration or formal opening of the stitches, but generally not indicated. For example, a hematoma of the neck um, is normally clinically apparent, either within the post-op day zero period or one period. Maybe the drain has occluded or there's a lot of drain output all of a sudden, and then you can see some ecchymoses and um, some firm expansion of the area. So expanding hematomas create lymphovascular compression, leading to airway compromise. Just in the same manner as an, in, of angioedema, so your scope examination may look similar to that. The goal for any expanding hematoma is to quickly evacuate the hematoma, which involves opening up the suture line as quick as possible and manually expre uh, expressing out and suctioning out the clot. And that will allow revascularization and um, the lymphatics to now drain from the affected area. So the patient is not going to die from tracheal compression, uh, it's more of the entity of lymph lymphovascular uh, congestion that's occurring that's causing airway compromise. And then following this, you will need to go to the operating room to identify a source of bleed and to close the skin.
there was a patient who underwent hemiglossectomy, neck dissection, and within the PACU, there's a large firm area within the supraclavicular region that was a hematoma that was quickly opened up and taken back to the operating room for ligation of a facial artery. Hypocalcemia can be a devastating postoperative emergency. It typically occurs in either total or completion thyroidectomy, can technically occur in hemithyroidectomy, but not as common, any parathyroid exploration, total laryngectomy, or level 6 neck dissection. Basically, any dis uh, dissection that can be within the confines of the parathyroid glands or to devascularize the parathyroid glands. Symptoms include cramps, paresthesias, seizures, tetany, bronchospasm, laryngospasm, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, Schwartz stick sign and Trousseau sign uh, can be present. EKG typically shows prolonged QT at first, and then torsades, VTAC, and followed by complete heart block. You should consider prophylactic calcium and vitamin D supplementation in the early preoperative period or even postoperative period. You should consider postoperative labs, including PTH, albumin, calcium, six hours post-op until normal if there is concern for hypocalcemia. Again, another lab to keep in mind or for some supplementation. Hypocalcemia may not correct until magnesium is corrected. And then treatment involves IV calcium gluconate via PICC line or slowly with a peripheral IV. There can be some pain and vascular necrosis associated with this, so a PICC line is generally advised. If the patient is taking PO, then starting calcitriol and calcium carbonate together is important. Knowing how to calculate corrected total serum calcium is important, so here's the equation for that. Knowing the general reference ranges is important as well. And then here is a uh, simplified algorithm. So if the calcium is greater than 7.5, then you can simply start with oral calcium and vitamin D and then supplementation with calcitriol. If the calcium is less than 7.5, then starting with IV calcium gluconate. If there are concerning symptoms or any cardiac arrhythmias, then starting IV gluconate supplementation and consideration for continuous infusion. Local flap emergencies, the common ones that we'll see, summital island, pectoralis major, small bilobed or labial flaps, and then paramedian forehead flaps. The common symptoms are duskiness, excessive pain, cool to the touch, absence of bleeding with pinprick. So there are several ways that you can treat local flap emergencies. The first one is leeches. So leeches should be used if there is any concern of vascular congestion, Hematocrit should be checked in patients who are undergoing leech therapy every eight hours and then covering for a bacterial um, organism in the leech's gut. Aromonas hydrophilia is important with fluoroquinolone coverage because there can be secondary infection. You can also use nitroglycerin paste, which might be a better option for most people. So low dose nitroglycerin ointment can be used twice daily to uh, vasodilate and to improve perfusion. And if you're going to use both, don't overlap the areas of nitroplase, paste, and leeches. Um, the leeches won't feed on the pasted sites. And then one way to get the leech to stick, basically you get a uh, 3cc um, syringe, put the leech at the end of it, cut the tip of it off, and then basically stick that area onto the patient's skin and wait until the leech latches onto it. Here are some local flap emergencies. Starting on the left here is a pectoralis major muscle flap that was identified as being somewhat dusky at post-op day two by the nurse. The nurse called me. I had asked them to take a picture and this was the appearance of it. So not terrible. Um, this could be considered to be within normal appearance, but the clinical suspicion should be high. I ultrasounded this area and did see a large hematoma under it and I evacuated at bedside, but the flap ultimately um, continued to die throughout the next couple of weeks. In the middle is a submental island flap for a hemiglossectomy defect. This is clearly dead, at least at the skin region. That might not mean that the entire flap is dead, but at least the distal supply for it. And then here is a bilobe flap with the distal necrosis here of this area. This can be uh, either treated conservatively or with a combination of leeches or nitro paste. So just for local flaps as well, free flaps, the biggest things that I think about are to obtain pictures either from the nurse or at home if there's concern, see the patient if they're in the emergency room, call the senior just to go over some of the, um, the concerning findings, and then call the attending who performed the flap. They're, they are going to want to know all of the updates about the flap because most of the flaps um, will actually survive even if there is post-operative complications or concern for vascular or venous uh, compromise.
So one of the important things that can happen during sign out uh, to mitigate confusion, there should be a thorough communication of the appearance of the surgical site, what the flap looks like, what kind of complex tissue reconstructive occurs, where is the vascular ped pedicle, is it something that we need to dop Doppler, if so, is there a stitch that mar marks the proper area for Doppler? What did the Doppler sound like? Was it biphasic or triphasic? Is there excess flat bulk? So maybe for an ALT or a PEC, you're going to uh, ex expect a certain degree of bulkiness to the flap that might, might not represent hematoma. Um, so one of those things to kind of sign out is what is the general appearance of the flap, including normal pictures and things like that. So overall, 10% of flaps may require revision surgery but overall success has exceeded 95%. Vascular pedicle thrombosis is the most common cause and generally occurs within the first 48 hours. Reasons for vascular compromise include venous thrombosis, which is most common, arterial thrombosis, anastomosis rupture, torsion of the flap, and microthrombi within the capillaries. Being familiar with what a postoperative flap looks like radiographically is important as well. These things kind of look strange, but for example, this is a ALT with a large fat component intraorally. And any concerns with flat viability or complications, like I said, should be immediately conveyed to the senior or attending to facilitate timely management. So like we said, nitroplast, leeches, heparin, or operative intervention. So here are two flaps that didn't go so well. Starting on the left is an ALT flap. Uh, you can see some duskiness to the skin. This ultimately died. And then a, another free flap uh, with some obvious necrosis and drying out of the skin as well. Next, we'll talk about bleeding emergencies. We already went through some postoperative bleeding concerns, but this will go over epistaxis, tracheostomy bleeding, oropharyngeal bleeding, some more postoperative bleeding, and then finally, carotid blowout. One of the most common consults that you'll have overall is likely epistaxis. Important to ensure that conservative measures have been trialed prior to you coming in, but generally they have but some things like afrin or oxymetazoline, neosinephrine, pressure either manually or with ALR clips, some TXA if they're in the emergency room, or adequate time. But like I said, generally by the time we get consulted, all of these things have failed and that's why they're asking ENT to come in. So asking a nurse to have proper equipment at bedside ready can be helpful. So things like suction tubing, an ENT card if you have those at your disposal, a large kidney basin, saline flushes, ice water, and then tape, and then tools to bring. Headlight, Fraser suction, nasal speculum, bayonet forceps, packing materials that we'll go through, silver nitrate, Q-tips, Afrin. Overall, the differential for epistaxis is pretty broad, but some of the potential etiologies of epistaxis are listed here. Commonly, primary mucosal irritation, cold weather or dry weather environment, things like nasal cannula or CPAP or a septal perforation. Some general systemic conditions which may make epistaxis more prone or worse is hypertension, chronic liver or kidney disease, antiplatelet or anticoagulation use, things like HHT as well are important considerations, trauma, digital manipulation, or if there's actual facial trauma, iatrogenic, such as after uh, nasal septal or sinus surgery that we talked about before, drugs like cocaine, infection like rhinosinusitis, inflammatory conditions, such as Wegener's, sarcoid, Turg Strauss, neoplastic conditions, any type of tumor, and then hematologic, von Willebrand's, and hemophilia. Overall, from the ENT perspective, we are generally going to cauterize or pack the nose, but important to know some reversal agents that are useful in epistaxis to recommend, starting with antiplatelet agents. The effects normally persist up to seven to 10 days, asking the primary team to hold if medically possible. Platelet transfusion may help as well. And then NSAIDs are more likely to be reversible with platelets. Anticoagulation, so warfarin, lovinox, heparin, there's a variable direct, uh, duration of effect based on the drug. You can hold the medication if possible. And then for warfarin in particular, you can use FFP or vitamin K. Herbal supplements, so remember our Gs, garlic, ginger, ginkgo, and ginseng, um, as well as some other herbal supplements have variable duration of effect. Thrombocytopenia, so platelet transfusion, can be used with a goal of greater than 50,000 for active bleeding and then greater than 10,000 to prevent spontaneous bleeding. Liver cirrhosis, monitoring the PT and INR using FFP for acute bleeding. Renal failure and uremia can be 
uh, ameliorated with desmopressin and hemodialysis. Von Willebrand's as well with desmopressin for types 1A and or 1 and 2A, and then factor 8 replacement, and then for hemophilia using the different factor replacements. And then I just have everyone's favorite, Clodding Cascade, up front with the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways highlighted. There's a lot of talk on transexamic acid, particularly within the emergency room literature, and here are some research articles that basically favor transexamic acid. In my opinion, it can't hurt. It's not going to be the end-all be-all in my opinion, but remembering that transexamic acid um, can be used to prevent the degradation of plasminogen to plasmin and then plasmin to fibrin, and having it on hand can sometimes be helpful as you are coming into the emergency room if the emergency room physicians are able to use it. Depending on the institution or the academic center that you're at, you may have various degrees of these options for non-absorbable and absorbable nasal packing. Non-absorbable nasal packing starts with mirror cells, which are kind of, in my opinion, the first line therapy. They don't provide a whole lot of tamponade or pressure, but it can be used in slow oozes. Rhino rocket is the colloquial term for essentially a mirror cell and a little plunger. I don't really use these at all. A rapid rhino is a more aggressive form of non-absorbable packing. This is a carboxymethylcellular shell around a nasal balloon that provides more uh, tamponade effect. They can come in different sizes. They can also come with various degrees of anterior and posterior balloons. An epistat is basically the largest uh, form of nasal packing and the most aggressive form, the last line, um, in my opinion. So an epistat is essentially a nasal, uh, a nasal catheter with two balloons, one that holds 10 cc's and one that holds uh, 30 cc's anteriorly. Historical types of ways to pack a nose, you can use a Foley catheter in this illustration that basically you pass the nasal uh, or the, the catheter through the nose, retrieve it from the mouth, blow up the, the balloon, and then pull anteriorly to tamponade off the nasopharynx, and then strip gauze used in this laminated fashion. Absorbable packing comes in many forms as well. There's gelatin forms like gel foam and surgifoam. Surgicel that comes in a bunch of different forms as well. Nasopore, hemopore, flow seal, surgiflow, arista, all really the preference of what you find works best. I generally will try to opt for an absorbable packing if it's self-limited and we don't need to come back to remove it. So these are all anecdotal tips that I have gathered from being on call. The first one that I tell junior residents, you can stop any nosebleed. Um, don't be afraid that you won't actually be able to stop it. There are always ways that you can intubate and pack the nasal cavity and oropharynx as last ditch effort, but starting with the patient supine and their head on the back of the bed sitting upright. You don't want them in a chair or uh, hanging over the edge of the bed because when you start to try to apply pressure and put packing in the nose, their general response is to pull back. So putting them supine, head on the back of the bed sitting upright is best practice. Having the patient kind of counterintuitively blowing the nose as hard as they can to evacuate, evacuate the clots so you can suction them out is helpful. You're not going to be able to see if there's a lot of blood clot. They're already bleeding and you're being consulted for bleeding. So don't worry too much about them exacerbating the bleeding with blowing the nose. Sometimes there is a considerable amount of force required to place nasal packing, particularly if they have a spur or a significant deviation. Um, you should consider asking the primary team to give pain medication prior or after nasal packing. I tell the patient it's generally going to uh, have a immediate headache right after I start to pack the nose. Consider what type of packing that we went through in the last slide or intervention that is going to yield the success of stopping the nosebleed without being overkill. So try to use absorbable packing or silver nitrate when available. If you're considering bilateral sources of epistaxis, start to be more suspicious of either a septal perforation or posterior epistaxis rather than simultaneous bilateral sources. So with septal perforation, there's a clear communication between both sides of the nose and that perforation can either bleed itself or it can allow blood products to traverse one side to the other. And then posterior epistaxis, when the coena closes with the soft palate, sometimes blood can go from one side to the other. Um, in my opinion, mirror cells work best for traumatic or slow oozes that you can't visualize or use bilaterally for septal perforations. If you soak the rapid rhino and aphrid prior to insertion, this helps with kind of sliding it into place in patient comfort, but it is slippery when wet. If you're using an epistat, you, you, you fill the epistat with sterile water. This is in um, relation to uh, the 
Rapid Rhino, which you actually use with air. So with the Epistat, you use sterile water, you inflate the 10 cc posterior balloon first, and then the anterior 30 cc's next. And this is very painful. The metric for success, in my opinion, is no bleeding out the front and no bleeding out the back. So always check the posterior oropharynx for any bleeding prior to uh, finishing the consult. It is okay to have a small amount of ooze for 15 to 20 minutes, in my opinion, after packing insertion. Allow some time for clot to form before exchanging or adding air or, you know, freaking out. There's little to no role, in my opinion, for anterior rapid rhino. Just because this area is easily visualized and accessible, you can um, use silver nitrate, you can use uh, dissolvable packing. So in my opinion, I don't really ever use the five centimeter or smaller uh, rapid rhino. And then, like I said, the last resort, you can always intubate and pack the oropharynx and nasal cavity. Starting with the top left, this is a B-bird picture of a patient who complained of unilateral immediate hearing loss or muffled hearing sensation after packing the nose. So this isn't uncommon to have hemotympanum. So if you pack the nose, the blood has nowhere to go and sometimes can retrograde up into the eustachian tube and fill the middle ear. This is not of worry, just like hemotympanum, it will resolve with time. It is not uncommon to see a large volume of bleeding with a, a posterior nasal bleed. This is just a, a picture that I took in the patient's bathroom uh, after being called in for a nosebleed. Here is a video that shows a very large septal perforation. So this can confuse you if this is all filled with blood clot and you're trying to remove it. Generally, the posterior portion of the septum is the culprit for bleeding, not necessarily in this case. And like I said before, putting two mirror cells on either side helps. Sometimes using a unilateral rapid rhino doesn't really use the tamponade effect because there's such a large nasal cavity. You can imagine this would be somewhat of a difficult clinical entity to treat epistaxis. This was a patient who was not bleeding, but did have a known uh, palatal defect and a fistula, basically after palate cancer with radiation. So this would be somewhat hard to treat if he did have large epistaxis, but you can even see turbinates and things back there. So maybe you'd be able to directly cauterize it. And this was a schizophrenic patient who was um, performing self-mutilation. So always bleeding from this area. There's not much that we can do without physically restraining the patient um, or getting psychi uh, psychiatry involved. Another very common on-call consultation in regards to bleeding is tracheostomy related bleeding. So most of these bleeds originate from the stomal region or peristomal region or related to suction trauma or uh, related to trach changes and are self-limiting. The timing can be important uh, to know during the workup. So fresh trach bleeds of significant, significant volume or persistence can originate in relation to the dissection for the tracheostomy. So uh, inadvertent injury to the thyroid gland, anterior jugular veins, or other, other etiologies should be thought of. So treatment conservatively with cautery or packing with um, dissolvable packing like Surgicel around the peristomal region, or at worst case going to the OR for hemostasis. Remote bleeds from tracheostomy generally suggest granulation tissue as seen in this lower photo of this pink abundant tissue, suction trauma, as seen here within this bronchoscopic view or more sinister origins, which we'll talk about. And then granulation can be conservatively managed either with silver nitrate cautery, direct excision. And then more serious causes of bleeding, such as a trachea nominate fistula, should always be considered and ruled out. So the first thought when you get a consult for tracheostomy tube bleeding, assume the worst. It almost never is, but that's one of the uh, more sinister types of bleeding from a trach that can occur. So ruling out other causes such as epistaxis, oral bleeding, and GI bleeding is also important. So scoping from above, um, not uncommonly epistaxis can present as a trach bleed, but generally there is some degree of nasal bleeding as well, which cues you. A cuffless tracheotomy tube should be exchanged to a cuffed tube to uh, protect the distal airway and tamponade if there is concern. And then, like I said, you must perform tracheos uh, tracheoscopy and or nasal endoscopy uh, to rule out other causes. The worst case scenario for any trach bleeding is obviously the tracheoanominant fistula. So the nominate artery or the brachiocephalic artery can fistulize into the trachea or the tracheostoma and cause massive and life-threatening hemorrhage. So this should always be the first thought anytime you have trach bleeding. A tracheonominant fistula makes up less than 1% of all trach bleeds and less than 10% of severe trach bleeds. When a tracheonominant fistula is identified, less than a quarter who make it to the operating room will survive. So this is a very high mortality type of condition. Generally, a sentinel bleed or herald bleed can occur. This can even peak two to three weeks following a trach, but this will occur as a 
quick, large volume blood loss that is followed by no bleeding or uh, self-limiting bleeding. And this can be a sign that impending doom can uh, you know, occur. So risk factors, high cuff pressures, low trach placement, repetitive head movements, diabetes, poor nutritional and wound healing status, kyphosis, or some form of hypotonia. So diagnosis is either clinically by our examination or via a CTA in which you'll see a stratization of the brachiocephalic artery. Treatment, so EMT's role is mainly to aid in diagnosis and temporization. So exchanging the, the trach to a cuffed endotracheal tube or a trach overinflated and performing the Utley mover, which is shown in this picture here, digital uh, compression of the brachiocephalic artery uh, anteriorly into the sternum to tamponade, and then cardiothoracic surgery versus IR for open or endovascular repair and stenting. Here you can see a stenting approach. Generally, ENT has a limited role in terms of treatment. It's more for diagnosis and to secure an airway. Here are illustrations of several proposed mechanisms of TI fistula formation, starting with erosion due to overinflation of the cuffs, so important in our postoperative patients or chronic trach patients with a cuff who are vent dependent. Um, having routine cuff pressures checked by respiratory therapy should occur. Erosion due to the tip, so inappropriately positioned patient or inappropriately uh, positioned trach, and then erosion due to a proximal uh, lumen of the trach, so this is also improper trach size. Diffuse oropharyngeal bleeding is another on-call emergency that is common within our critically ill patients. So like I said, there's a lot of diffuse uh, bleeding seen in different etiology. And some of this is discussed elsewhere in the presentation, but commonly it's in the intubated critically ill patient who is either on ECMO, anticoagulation, DIC, liver transplant, COVID uh, positive, at least in my experience, who's bleeding from all orifices. So generally, it's a diffuse type of mucosal bleeding without a singular source identified. This can either be from the septum, turbinates from nasogastric tube trauma, palate and tonsils from endotracheal tube trauma, teeth and gums from oral hygiene performed by the nurses. The ENT role, in my opinion, is to plug all of the holes and allow medicine to reverse the coagulopathy. So Curlix, soaked in betadine, is put in the mouth kind of in the reverse fashion of this old magic trick. Um, betadine is generally used, in my opinion, to confuse the nurses about the saturation of blood from the curlic. So you soak it in betadine to confuse the nurses, but also um, to prevent infection and to uh, mitigate the smell that can sometimes occur if this is left in place for a couple of days. So uh, routinely exchanging it is also um, advised. And then packing the nose bilaterally. Mirror cells, if it's a slow ooze versus rapid rhinos, um, basically on the discretion on how much, how much ooze is there. And then another catch-all of postoperative bleeding, we've generally talked about all of this in this lecture, but epistaxis, post tonsillectomy, hemorrhage, neck hematoma, bleeding from neck surgery, excessive bloody drain output, ear bleeding following otologic surgery, and post tracheostomy hemorrhage. The things that I think about is really trying to quantify the amount of bleeding to get an idea. Is this concern or is this postoperative uh, bleeding within normal range? Triage recommendations, if they're at home, you know, should they come into the hospital? Should you uh, use conservative measures with holding pressure or Afrin? If the patient is in the ER in the hospital, you should evaluate them. And then you should determine whether or not you need to call the senior or attending if there's concerning amounts, and then certainly call the attending if you think that this needs the OR. Another very deadly consult that you might get is the carotid blowout. So again, similar to the pathophysiology of the tracheonominate fistula, the carotid blowout may be heralded by a lower volume or sentinel bleed and should be considered in all cancer patients with predisposing tumors or prior radiation treatment. So carotid blowouts can be categorized as three different types. So starting with threatened, a threatened carotid blowout is when there is evidence of imaging or exam of risk of blowout without actual any bleeding. And pending is when there is self-limited bleed or the herald or sentinel bleed. And an active blowout is when the patient is actively bleeding. So for ENT, the treatment is similar to the tracheonominate fistula in terms of diagnosis, securing an airway, tamponading, and then addressing the problematic arterial bleeds either with open approaches in the operating room or endovascular approaches with embolization and stenting by our interventional radiologists. So consideration of uh, CT angiography, MR angiography, balloon occlusion testing can be considered, but really if the patient is having large volume bleeding and you need to occlude a vessel or tie it off, the risk of hemiplegic stroke is not of much concern when the risk of bleeding is much higher. IR consultation um, can also be employed too uh, in terms of 
diagnostic angiography or endovascular techniques if the patient's stable. In addition to carotid blowouts, significant or even fatal bleeding can occur from some of the other branch, uh, branches like the lingual artery, um, jugular vein, or from the tumor directly. And here you can see a CTA with a extravasation of the common carotid artery and um, after stenting, here is the end result. So here are some pictures of patients that we've encountered uh, who were at very high risk of carotid blowout. So starting on the left, here is a patient with untreated head neck cancer, which is a terrible type of way to go. So this is a large fungating lesion, obviously within the territory of the great vessels, and this is something that is an impending blowout waiting to happen. And then on the right here is a patient who actually had undiagnosed, untreated lymphoma, and obvious necrosis and fungating lesion as well. And then in the middle here is flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy in a post-radiated neck who actually had osteoradionecrosis. This is a patient as well, imaging findings that can be concerning for a carotid blowout. And then finally, a catch-all is kind of the miscellaneous emergencies that we'll go through. Nasal foreign bodies, ear foreign bodies, vertigo, sudden sensor neural hearing loss, and facial paralysis. Starting with nasal foreign bodies, as we had discussed before generally, this is not an emergency. The caveat is that if it is a button battery, if there's concern for button battery, this does represent an emergency due to the deleterious effects and necrosis that can come about with button battery um, foreign bodies. The mother's kiss techniques, technique is a unique um, and kind of a, a easy one to have in your back pocket and works well in pediatric patients. So you can see here the mother's kiss technique involves sealing off the child's mouth, either with a bag mask valve or a bag mask ambu type of bag uh, seen here, or the mother actually placing her lips over the child's lips and then blocking off the uh, nostril that does not have the nasal form body and then forcefully blowing or bagging in the child's mask uh, mouth that allows the nasal form body to you know, quickly be, be dislodged. Um, an incidental finding of a rhinolith, which is kind of a uh, calcified secretion, um, can be read from the radiologist standpoint as a foreign body. There's usually um, you know, some other symptoms associated with this as well. A unilateral foul smelling discharge in a child should be considered a foreign body until proven otherwise. A nasal foreign body is considered an airway foreign body, but there's usually a low risk of migration. Depending on the material of the foreign body, there is potential uh, to cause mucosal damage, bleeding, infection, aspiration, uh, especially with inorganic material or organic materials can cause this as well. Sometimes they are difficult to retrieve in the emergency room or in the uh, clinic, but it is possible without sedation. Multiple attempts should not be made. This is more traumatizing to the child and you can always watch and wait and allow the child to calm down or take them to the operating room. They tend to lie in one of two locations within the nasal fossa. The first is the floor of the inferior turbinate, so kind of where this rhinolith is sitting, or anterior to the middle turbinate. And then we have a classic picture of what uh, appears to be the double ring sign of a button battery. Similar to the nasal foreign body, an ear foreign body is generally, again, not an emergency. Again, a button battery is considered an emergency. You can see a picture of one here with the associated um, damage. Alive insects can be killed with lidocaine or removed later. Here's a bee bird picture of a child that I saw with a routine T-tube follow-up, and he actually had a dead ant attached to the T-tube, um, which was removed. But the alive insects, for, for example, a cockroach does not have the ability to turn around, so they're commonly seen, at least within our patient population. Um, you should fill the ear canal with lidocaine and wait until the insect is dead before attempting any retrieval. Sometimes if the insect is alive, looking in the ear canal with a bright light can kind of force the insect away and can further traumatize the tympanic membrane. The ER generally tries to remove these foreign bodies, causes trauma, bleeding, and a scared patient, and then calls you. So normally, if there's no concern of either a live insect or a, foreign, or a button battery foreign body, then you can schedule follow-up as outpatient, uh, either use drops if there's concern for superinfection or if there is associated edema, and then we can either try removal in the clinic or OR removal. An operating head otoscope is, in my opinion, vital for success for visualization and removal. This allows you to use alligators and other instruments within direct line of sight to remove foreign bodies. A uh, number of different techniques, curette, loop, suction, flushing techniques, um, right angles are, are great for uh, circular or spherical objects. And then I've used uh, a pen magnet similar to this, which is telescoping for magnetic um, foreign bodies. And you just basically 
you know, pluck them out as they attracted to the magnet at the end here. And again, do no harm. Stop if the child is traumatized or if there's any concern for TM injury and there might be further uh, damage if this isn't done in kind of a controlled environment. Another miscellaneous emergency that I've included here is vertigo. Generally not true emergencies. Um, it's easy to differentiate between the common three, labyrinthitis, Meniere's, and BPPB. Here are the associated uh, symptoms and then remembering what our different forms of nystagmus look like. You obviously want to rule out, and the ER generally does this, ruling out a stroke in the persistent dizzy patient. Traumatic sources, um, as we discussed in the temporal bone trauma portion of the lecture, persistent vertigo is uncommon in temporal bone trauma, but it can be associated with post-traumatic BPPV, otocapsule fractures, or paralymphatic fistulas. And then here's a small um, tidbit about serious and separative labyrinthitis, which we want to um, treat effectively to prevent further complications such as meningitis, hearing loss, uh, persistent dizziness. And then disequilibrium is common and may persist for weeks, but hearing loss may be permanent. One of the otologic emergencies that the otolaryngologist should be comfortable getting woken up in the middle of the night is sudden sensorineural hearing loss. This is the clinical entity in which the patient typically describes the inability to hear completely on one side. And really the question that I ask them is, can they use the phone on the affected side? If not, then my suspicion is raised for um, sudden sensorineural hearing loss. So this is described as occurring acutely in three days or less, 30 decibels or greater in hearing loss in three contiguous frequencies. So our academy does publish clinical practice guidelines um, for certain diagnoses, and this is one that you should be comfortable with. There is a worse prognosis um, conveyed if the patient is acutely vertiginous. A head MRI with gadolidium or high res um, heavily weighted T2 sequences should be used to rule out retrocochlear pathology in all patients regardless of hearing recovery because you can have a brief uh, sudden sensorineural hearing loss that does resolve and have a retrocochlear lesion at the same time. You should consider using one milligram per kilogram prednisone to a max dose of 60 milligrams for five to 10 days, and in many cases using a taper. And then there is a strong uh, consideration for concomitant GI ulcer prophylaxis with a proton pump inhibitor because of the high steroid. And here are some other literature and some journals on the prognosis and some of the next steps in terms of sudden sensorineural hearing loss. But this should be one of the otologic emergencies that you should be comfortable treating and identifying. Next is facial paralysis. So we all know the house wrapping grading system. So this should be used in terms of documentation. There is a broad differential diagnosis for acute facial nerve paralysis. You can see uh, common things like infectious causes like herpes zoster and Lyme disease. Um, miscellaneous, remember that Bell's palsy represents idiopathic facial nerve paralysis, but other things like uh, Guillain-Barre, Melkerson, Rosenthal, sarcoid or neurosarcoid. Trauma, as we discussed in our temporal bone fractures, other lacerations that include the um, extratemporal branches of the facial nerve tumors like vestibular schwannoma and meningiomas, and then vascular and neurologic that we've discussed ruling out strokes and um, other multiple sclerosis, TIA, and vascular malformations. So again, initiation of high-dose systemic steroids within 72 hours, document the house Brackman score, check for vesicular eruption on ears, and ask about otalgia and hearing loss. Patients should be counseled regarding the risks of systemic steroids as indicated below. Options, again, include prednisone 1 mg per kg to max dose of 60 for 10 days taper for adults, again, using GI prof ulcer prophylaxis with a PPI. And then use of antivirals is controversial, but in this instance, um, for Ramsey-Hunt syndrome or herpes zoster oticus, you should have a higher um, predilection to using antivirals. You're remembering that herpes zoster oticus is a viral polyneuropathy, so you might other ha have other affected cranial nerves as well. And here is an example of a video of a patient that I had diagnosed. She had vesicular eruption on the right side. And any patient with painful um, facial nerve paralysis, you should have a high suspicion of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So again, you'll be able to see the Bell's phenomenon on her, on her right eye. When she's trying to close her eye, the eye reflexively goes up and out to protect the cornea. So again, complete facial nerve paralysis on this right side. After initiation of steroids, she had full recovery. Mild kinesis, though, afterwards. And here was an interesting case of a younger female who presented with initial vesicular eruption around the ear and, patient, uh, and painful facial nerve paralysis. And 
she actually presented with a exact V3 dermatomal type of distribution of uh, shingles, which um, was kind of interesting to see exactly V3 being um, being illustrated here. And remembering that the tongue sensory innervation comes from lingual via V3, and the half of the tongue was also affected as well. She had the same type of treatment and underwent un uneventful recovery. This concludes my presentation on ENT emergencies. Again, this is not meant to substitute medical um, advice or information. This is all relatively anecdotal information that's specific towards my institution, uh, my attending preferences, and the patient population that we deal with here in Philadelphia. Thank you.